DAC members, we're going to get started on meeting number seven, Monday, August 13th. A uh, few different housekeeping items, SAG members and members of the public, if you have not validated your parking, please take two or three minutes and validate your parking so no one's trapped in the garage to the, tonight. Okay, I think everyone has that. So um, before I hand it off to Dave to walk through the meeting, I just want to do kind of a few other housekeeping items. Um, first, normally I would ask for a motion and we'd approve minutes from the last meeting. Um, but we had a little bit of a hiccup, um, which is my mistake. So um, I'm going to need you guys to do a different vote if you would like to continue tonight. But essentially we posted tonight's agenda on the Diridon sj.org website, which is kind of the main website um, for this process, as well as the city's the city's uh, city clerk public calendar. We have a sunshine requirement that it gets posted to the city attorney's Brown Act page, which did not up correctly. So agenda was posted in two spots, but it was not posted there. So the group can move forward with this meeting if they would like, but you do need to vote on this amended agenda and if you would like to continue with tonight's meeting before we can move forward um, as part of our sunshine requirements. Um, and then we'll approve the meeting minutes when we come back to you in September for the two meetings. Can I get a motion from anyone to hear the meeting tonight? Kathy, second from Laura. Okay. Anyone opposed to having the meeting tonight? Besides me. <laughs> okay. Um, so thank you very much. Um, the last bit of housekeeping, obviously we have a lot of people here would like to participate tonight, and I'm imagining a majority of them would like to participate around the big policy discussion we're, happen we're having tonight, and not some of the housekeeping stuff at the end of the meeting. So as a facilitator, I'm gonna take item number six, which is the public comment uh, out of order, and move that up to be heard directly after the housing and the job solution group. So the, a bulk of this meeting is gonna take place on those two issues. The, the updates we have beforehand are relatively minor and we do wanna spend a little bit of time on kind of the structure of the report at the end of the meeting if we do have time, but I'm imagining we're quite a bit of uh, dialogue with the SAG and the general public tonight on those solution groups. So we will do public comment after item number uh, five on the agenda tonight. Um, to the general public, if you have comment cards, they go to Lauren right here, and we will do our best as staff to go outside and make sure that any members of the, that aren't in here, comment cards, and we will be announcing names out there as well so they have the ability to come in. Um, with that, I'm gonna hand it off to Dave, and we will get started on the meeting tonight. Thank you, Lee. Great to see you all again. Thank you for spending your Monday evening with us. Excuse As always, me. I'm going to go Excuse over the agenda. Yeah. Can I just, th sorry, this isn't, I know, you can only hear my voice and not see me. Maria Noel, right there here. There you are. Hey, Maria. I just, can we get an update through the process in terms of how we're making sure that the public is actually being able to hear the conversation? I know their staff is working on that, but if folks can let us know as that's resolved, because that is worrisome, I think, to many of us. Thank you. Folks outside, is that what you're referring to, Maria? Yes. Okay. I believe there's no overflow room, so people who want to hear the meeting aren't able to do so. And I think, yeah, so would like updates as that gets resolved. Yeah, so um, while Dave is doing this, I'm going to be talking to staff. Normally, when we've had large meetings here in the past, we've had a bit of overflow in council chambers. Um, we are going through AV updates in there right now, so we don't have the ability to broadcast. Um, and you can kind of see this room's already been done. Chambers was the last one, and that we just didn't get it done in time. So we will be trying to figure out how we put a computer or another television monitor out there in the next few minutes. Thank you, Lee. Thank you for the question, Maria. Uh, so as Lee mentioned, we're going to switch one item around the public comment. But as usual, we're going to go through the meeting notes from the last meeting, make sure that we capture that input appropriately. Uh, we're going to give you a quick update on the engagement process and let you know what we've been up to, some of the information that we've gathered to date, and, uh, and what we're planning moving forward. We have Deered on stationary updates. Um, Bill from the city is going to give you a couple quick updates about what's been happening in the stationary over the past few months. 
Uh, we're going to have, most importantly, a bulk of this evening's meeting is going to be for the report back from the jobs and housing groups. Uh, as you know, we had a, a preliminary report back from the housing. They had a third meeting. We're going to give you some up updates of what happened at that meeting. We did surveys at both those groups and have that information to share. So a lot of great information to share that we're um, going to present to you all and then have a discussion about. Uh, then we'll have public comment after that. Then we're going to also talk through, as you've been hearing over the past few meetings, we have a report that's going to be the culmination of all this great information that we're gathering. We're going to give you an update on the outline of that report tonight and have a discussion with you all about what all is going to go in. My mic's going crazy. All right, let's try that. Uh, and then we're going to talk through next steps, as we usually do. So with that, as always, we start with the SAG group agreements. You all have been excellent and very respectful. I want to make sure that stays, that consistency stays through this meeting, both for you all and the members of the public. We want to be respectful of people's time and their viewpoints and perspectives. We don't want to talk over each other. Always remember to flip your name tags to the side so we can call on you and make sure everyone is heard. And just remember that we have a diverse group of perspectives here and everyone's points are valid. We want to make sure they're heard as we go through the process. And then we've been doing this excellently, really working together collaboratively to think big. I think you all have been fantastic at that. We really appreciate you for that. And I always like to say, have fun and make new friends. That's always the, the best part of that process. So real quick overview of what happened at the last meeting. Uh, we did have report backs from three different groups one of which was the Parks Open Space Sustainability and Neighborhood Quality of Life. Uh, we put these into big buckets. We had a lot of conversation about transit planning, recognizing that Deardon is a hub and connecting regionally um, through important open spaces. We call them those the green fingers, I believe, was part of that as well, which kind of shows up in the parkland section. Uh, we talked about the high-speed rail and to avoid impacts on existing park spaces. Um, as far as the design of Parkland, again, those green fingers were mentioned as a way to kind of extend the network throughout the area. Um, we talked about reducing park impact fees to build new parks. We talked about requiring buildings adjacent to parks to take advantage um, of that park space and really kind of integrate it. We talked about public restrooms as an essential piece of the parks, which is something that's sometimes overlooked. So it was great to bring that up. And just general collaboration to take advantage of the work that's being done and to collaborate with cor corporate partners to provide the funding and resources to keep that, the uh, parks spaces and, and keep that at the forefront moving forward. Um, we also had the transportation access and traffic group report out. We talked about the travel demand management piece um, and, and parking needs, again, minimizing parking, hopefully to reduce driving and, and really looking at increasing the availability of infrastructure for peds and bikes. We talked about trip caps potentially and looking around at other cities like Mountain View as examples. Uh, company sponsored programs really to kind of, again, give resources to folks to take advantage of other, of other modes of transportation. Uh, we talked about separate bus and traffic and, and taxi traffic and other modes, making sure that they have availability to get through the area. Adequate parking for bikes, another one that's sometimes overlooked. Um, we all mentioned is something that's important. And then the transit planning, again, aligning high-speed rail um, and making sure that it doesn't close off intersections or impact housing in the area. Lastly, we had land use and urban design represented. We talked a lot about the design of development that would happen in the area, making sure that it's not insular and it's very approachable and integrated with the site and, and easy to access. Uh, we talked about support for local and existing businesses, strategic about retail, and making sure that it's uh, homegrown and has a unique character so it really has a chance to stand out, provide more housing. That's been a kind of consistent link through this process, but affordable housing in particular of all types. And we talked a lot about affordable by design and kind of what that means, different size units. Um, and exploring an equity analysis, that has been brought up a few times and, and thinking about service contract workers, and that'll be something that we'll kind of explore moving forward. Um, we talked about mixed use, which is often something that we use to make sure that there's eyes on the street all times of day. Uh, that was something that you all definitely found important. Green infrastructure was brought up here. That seemed to be a consistent thread throughout the entire process. We talked about stormwater capture and green roofs, 
concern for lack of height variation and making sure that there's a variety in the skyline. And then we talked about value capture and how important that is, especially if zoning is changed as we go through this process. So that covers the, each one of the report back groups. Um, we did have overall, <coughs> excuse me, overall comments as well uh, to extend for the neighborhood to extend these principles to adjacent neighborhoods and not just Deardon um, to make sure that we have this cohesive approach, make strong statements to preserve and protect homes, parks, history, and connectivity, uh, ensure existing neighborhoods benefit from development in the Deardon Station area, redevelopment the south side of Deardon, um, create a sense of place through historic and art, uh, or histor historic and art uh, to create the identity for the area, enhance connections to downtown again, sustainable design as we talked about as a common thread. And then through the planning process, understand that there's a parking management plan that's been done um, and there's a lot of stakeholder input to take into account. And then lastly, to ensure that policies do not impede on achieving the grand vision for the area. So that was a lot to absorb all at once, but just want to make sure we captured everything correctly from the last meeting. Is there any input that we might have missed that you all want to let us know about? Are you pointing at your own? Hey, Harvey. I thought you were pointing in front of you. There you go, Harvey. There you go. Harvey Darnell, North Willow Bend Neighborhood Association. And I was on both the uh, parks and open space and the uh, transportation, and we stress uh, quite a bit in both of them the need to uh, complete the Los Gatos Creek Trail, uh, hopefully uh, off street, and um, it's not showing up in either of your takeaways. Those, those were included in the summary notes. These were just, I should have clarified, these were input that we got from the SOG on the summary and the report backs, that's definitely part of the summary notes that we got from those groups. This was just additional information that the SOG brought up during the discussion. So that's definitely integrated in those summaries. So it will be listed as an important definitely. issue? Definitely. It's part of the... Uh, uh, the okay. I just wanted to yeah. make sure that you didn't somehow, it didn't rise to the very top and you eliminated it. Not at all. It's, it's part of the desired outcomes and potential solutions. That we have. Good point though, Harvey. Thank okay, you. Thank you. All right, if there aren't any other comments, we're going to move on to the next agenda item. All right, so I'm just going to provide a couple quick updates on the engagement process. Uh, first up is the pop-up workshops. Oh, I'm so sorry about that. Uh, we've completed a couple, and we have a few more planned, including one this weekend at the District 2 Village Fest. And basically, these are where we go to, uh, to community events with tables, uh, you can see in the bottom right there, that was from the Willow Glen Dancing on the Avenue event. Um, we our goal is to spread awareness of the process, share information, collect input, and we have an email list that we're collecting. Uh, and so I'll be sending out an email uh, update this week, in fact. And then stakeholder meetings, we've met with a couple. I accidentally put downtown association as completed, but that's one that is, um, should be in the bottom list that's in the works. And so we uh, are working on having a few more meetings at uh, these community centers. Um, most of those will be uh, in early to mid-September. So the point of them will be to start reporting back on the feedback we have been getting and uh, just continuing the conversation and making sure people are understanding what's, what we're doing here. So uh, the other items that we're still working on is a survey. Uh, so we will be hopefully getting you more information on that later this week as to what that survey will look like and how we'll be uh, implementing it. So those are the main updates I have for now. Any questions on the process? Not seeing any. Oh, nope, Paul has one. Thank you. Thanks, Lori. So this actually isn't the question. I just wanted to provide an update for the benefit of the rest of the group. The San Jose Downtown Residents Association, we hosted a forum on August 2nd. That's one of the ones that's listed up here for stakeholder meetings with about 35 to 40 downtown residents. And I just wanted to share out uh, some of the, th the items that came up for discussion very quickly. Uh, Integrating Google with the downtown business communities, looking for models of partnership with local restaurants and cafes and other businesses, 
collaboration with San Jose Police Department. This was one of the questions that they thought this group should be tackling in particular, and it hasn't really come up explicitly, so something for all of us to consider for maybe the next phase of SAG or a future meeting. Uh, ensuring that San Jose's rich history is preserved and incorporated. We've had some discussions about that already at the group, but that came up and we had a, a pretty lengthy discussion about that. Uh, residents would like to better understand why San Jose downtown has struggled to take off and would like to see presentations on research on that question. That's more of a staff point, I think, but that was, a, that was an item we discussed. Uh, would like, they would like to see some exploration for how Google and, and the changes with the Deerdon Station area more generally can be part of the homelessness conversation with special attention given to mental illness. They would like to see consideration of new transport technologies. I didn't necessarily see that in the previous slide, but things like automated vehicles and other new technologies. And then early activation of public spaces while developed place. And that, I think, aligns with uh, what Bill, one of our other representatives, had talked about during his TED Talk. So I just wanted to share that. We're planning on doing more of these forms with downtown residents, so I'll be sure to uh, keep you all apprised. Thank you so much. Um, Sarah. Hi, are those the full list of stakeholders that you're planning on meeting with? This is the current list of the ones that we've been uh, in conversation with planning. Um, so for example, with Mayfair Community Center, it's uh, partnering with Somos Mayfair. Uh, so we have, we continue to put out the option to all of you and any other community group mm -hmm. that if you're holding a meeting and want staff there, just like uh, Paul mentioned, that we're still available. So it's not a hard line. We're not, I'm not saying we're not doing any more, but these are just the ones that are in the works. All right, I think that's it. Just very quickly, uh, I just wanted to say thank you to Lori and San Jose staff, Bill Eckert, uh, for coming out. Google as well was present. So we had a really good conversation and, and thank you for helping. Thank you. So next up, Bill Eckern is going to talk about some uh, other things going on relevant to the Deerdon Station area. Sure. So point of order, uh, the, the council chambers open, so we made an announcement. Some are, are wishing to not watch in council chambers. When we do public comment, and for anyone that's already in chambers, because uh, some, some did leave, we're going to call 10 names out at a time and start a line here. So if anyone is in chambers and, and hears their name, come over and even though we're at some capacity issues, we will find you way, a way for you to come in, comment, and then go back out. But we are gonna call a big chunk of na uh, names at one time um, so that no one loses out on their opportunity to give public comment. Are you collecting cards outside? What was the question, sorry? Are you collecting cards outside? Yes, we are collecting cards outside. Getting deaf as I get old. Sorry, um, I'm Bill Ecker, and I'm the project manager for all things Zerodon for the city, out working out of economic development. <laughs> can I? Can you hear me now? Okay. Great. Thank you. A um, couple of things. I'm I, I'm going to be very brief with updates tonight because a couple of these topics um, are on, they're all ongoing, but it's important just to let you know that we are coordinating. On the BART phase two, there are ongoing conversations between the city's staff and the, and the BART staff about um, schedule of BART moving forward with uh, construction impact mitigation plans and thinking about how the, the system is going to move into, the, into downtown and into the Duradon Station area. Probably the significant piece to look forward to is they anticipate sometime around November to bring on the general contractor to begin then moving into the design phase and moving forward with that project. On high-speed rail, the city and, and um, high-speed rail staff continue to talk, and we had a, a very productive meeting with uh, the, uh, neighbors from the Gardner area in South last week to talk about areas of concern, many of which you've heard already at, through this meeting, and I think it's being taken into consideration by both the city and high-speed rail as we move forward into, the, into that project and defining it. Kind of this all culminates, though, as we pull into the Deerdon Integrated Station concept 
the city in collaboration with VTA, High Speed Rail, and Caltrain have embarked on a contract with um, a design firm that's comprised of two firms. One is Arcadis, which is an international construction management engineering firm, and a, a Dutch architectural firm, Bentham Crowell, who are responsible for a large number of the r integrated rail stations, in, especially in Holland, but elsewhere um, in Europe. And we will begin that process in September with internal working um, as the different agencies get, on, get up to speed and get the, the team up to speed to begin formulating our desires for that. There will be an outreach program that Lori's putting together now that will go out in the fall to begin the process of community engagement as that process begins to evolve. We look forward to bringing the, the, the Dutch team here to a meeting in the fall that they can at least talk to you about <coughs> how they go about designing projects and get you an understanding of the sorts of things that they're going to be looking for. The last piece that I think is important for you to understand is that as we move forward with development that begins to, that occurs in the Deardon Station area, we've identified about $70 million in, uh, of in needed infrastructure just to implement the Deardon Station plan as it was approved by the City Council in 2014. So we've brought on a consulting team to help us look at how you distribute those costs of infrastructure across all of the development, residential, commercial, retail, hotels, whatever development occurs in that area so that we can move forward and get those that infrastructure in place as development occurs. And so we anticipate hopefully by the end of this year being to the City Council with some recommendations on an initial phase of, a, of an impact, development impact fee. And with that, I'm glad to answer any questions. Kathy. Hi, thanks, Bill. One of the things that I'd like to just get a little bit more clarification on is that the Greater Gardner, Delmas Park, North Willow Glen um, neighborhoods met with uh, high speed rail last week. And, and the presentation was strictly on the two original routes that high speed rail proposed, which were the at grade and then the aerial route. And so I'd like to know. Um, what the thought is on how that that's going to change because everything that I think we've been talking about as the SOG brings in another option. I, I think professionally and technically I'd rather le I'd leave this to high speed rail to answer the specifics for how they see their project moving forward. I can answer city specific questions but I think Boris is probably better aligned. Sure, I, I don't know if I need to put up my yeah. card or not. But <laughs> And I think we had part of this conversation uh, at, at the meeting, but you know, I think the difference between kind of what we're looking at for as part of our environmental documents, which is the question of how do we bring high-speed rail to San Jose, that's kind of a singular question within our agency's purview to, to try to answer that as, as part of that process. The reason that we're undertaking DISC and working together with the city and with Caltrain um, and VTA is so that we could actually look at something bigger than that. And so um, that's a you know, there's kind of obviously a two parts of that of that equation. Um, what we see is in that for our project, we still have to look, move forward with looking at the, that first piece of it. But at the same time, what we I think ultimately want, and I think why we're doing this process, is a is a much bigger vision than just adding high speed rail to the station. Um, and so that's what we're still working through with how those overlay and kind of obviously making sure that it's the right thing that ultimately gets built. Um, that's the end of the day, the, the, the key question there. And so um, we are not able to study DISC by ourselves. We're <laughs> simply not in position to do that. Um, but that's what we're working through and what Bill mentioned in terms of how we're working together on some of those questions. So more to come. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, around September, we can look forward to more details, uh, specifically with the Deardon Station area for noise abatement, vibration impacts, that type of thing, where we can ask those detailed questions. I'm, ass I'm assuming you're talking about BART construction types of impacts? Of yeah, directly impacting us right next to Deardon. Those will be, uh, again, I'm not quite sure I fully understand the question. The Deardon Station, that planning that we're just starting out looking at, 
this first epi this first bit of work is simply to look at what are the program boxes that we need to build to make a station that's the most functional, provides the best customer service, and meets the urban design needs for for the city and and the agencies. It won't we won't be anywhere near construction impact or even thinking about that for many years to come. The the, the work that the city is doing with BART. It does look that at that specifically, and I don't have a schedule yet to tell you when they will begin to roll out the construction mitigation plans and thinking for how the BART construction is going to go. Great. Okay, thank you. I just want to make sure that we stay ahead of the calendar. Definitely. Jeffrey. Yeah, just a, a question. On the, uh, for the infrastructure fee plan, um, uh, will this body get a chance to take a look at a first draft of that before it heads to council? Um, and I'd, I'd recommend that'd be a good idea maybe in that uh, November meeting when we review uh, the integrated station concept. Um, and if not, uh, do you envision the infrastructure related recommendations that we've talked about? Uh, will that be integrated into the, the, the staff's report to council on that fee? The intent of the, of the fee analysis <coughs> is to look at, as I said, roughly $70 million uh, of infrastructure it's it's sewer and water and parking and parks and and things like that that were identified um, to implement the the dirt on area station plan it w as it was approved by the city council because that's all we know today but as as the, as projects come in the, our plan our vision is that over time we would when the council evaluates their f the fees for that we would add, we could add projects in or as projects are done they go away so that it would be a living plan for implementing improvements and projects that are identified as we move forward over over the course of time whether it comes here or not i will leave that to others that uh, set this up jim dirt on station area plan obviously what's being discussed now is much more intense than that so would you expect that number to potentially increase and how is that going to be kind of assessed and then addressed that's a question that we're looking at right now with the uh, city public works the engineering firm that did the initial analysis and the people that are going to do the fee study to make sure to see if we missed anything or if what we captured supports the conceptual levels of Dublin. Again, we don't have a project from Google or anyone else that we can really estimate how much of an acceleration there might be in development or capacity. So those are the things that we anticipate would be picked up in the future. If the development cap increased for whatever particular reason, we would anticipate being able to catch it at that future date. Yes, Nicole. Nicole Brown, La Alameda. This is more of a ground clarification question. Um, the, I believe it's four um, neighborhood, like neighborhood committees that are meeting and, and sharing their notes. They're not in my backyard kind of committee. Are the, is that a violation for them to share those notes with the SAG after they've met? I will leave that to uh, to Lee or, or David. I, I don't think there's a brown act, but I will leave that to, to others. Um, I'm getting hit back and forth, so it's not a violation. Great. Thank you very much, David. Bill? Yes, Kevin. Sorry, Bill. I, I don't know if this is your realm or not, but I know that um, at one point, we were told that the uh, city of San Jose had um, hired different um, consultants to help on the high-speed rail options, and there was two groups. One was the one that we've heard from mostly so far was the at-grade and the aerial alignments, but we've never heard one thing about um, the underground option and any of the possibilities or problems with that. And I know that the, we, you know, we, <laughs> the city of San Jose paid a lot of money, hence taxpayers paid a lot of money for that. And we haven't heard zero on that. When are we going to hear on that? I, I can't answer that question specifically. Um, I don't know if the staff here is prepared to answer the question. How about we come back at your next meeting and be able to provide you that information as part of this update? That would be fine. 
safe to go now? <laughs> you escape. Thank you very much, Bill. And I want just to remind you all, we're keeping notes of all the input that's being provided, so we'll make sure to get back to you, as, as Bill suggested, um, on all the input we're receiving. So thank you very much. With that, we're going to transition to the report outs uh, from the Jobs and Education and Housing and Displacement Solution Groups. Where do you want to read off? So we're structuring this report back, or these two report backs, the same as we did for the three that we had at last meeting. So I'll just quickly remind you that uh, the purpose is to give you a summary of what was discussed. We by no means are capturing every comment. Um, so we'll leave the, it up to the advisory group members that were part of the solution groups to uh, highlight anything that they feel is not adequately highlighted on these slides. Um, but we just encourage you to be looking for the overlaps and commonalities and anything that you think needs further exploration. Um, so we'll just spend a few minutes summarizing um, first the jobs, then we'll do a follow-up uh, follow discussion with you all, and then we'll uh, turn to housing after that. Thank you, Lori. So we're going to jump right into housing here. Just I want to... Our jobs, uh, look at that, I'm already off. So jobs and education, I'm so excited about housing, we're gonna get there soon. Uh, so quickly, the overall themes that were discussed by the group, and then we'll get into some of the desired outcomes and potential solutions. The overall themes included the uh, taking in concern the social equity effects of Google or other development coming to San Jose and, and the impact that might have on folks, um, particularly those that are what was brought up was job patching, where they have to have three or four jobs to kind of to pay their rent or to pay their way, and making sure that benefits from this development actually um, actually uh, give long-term residents some benefit as as the development comes to be. There is general agreement that economic development and educational strategies should build upon resources and programs available, and we heard a lot about education, and we'll get into that as well. Of of how we can boost that up in the process. Um, as we keep hearing throughout this whole process, the group discussed a lot about the links between jobs and housing um, and making sure that, that we understand the impacts on affordable housing so that lower wage workers can find a place to live here and work here um, and reduce the displacement pressures. Uh, and there was also a couple folks um, that mentioned just to take into consideration as we're making these requests, it, just to think if we're actually requiring different uh, requirements on Google than we would any other developer, and just to take that into account as we're going through this process to make sure that we're, we're kind of being fair in this process and not treating Google unlike we would any other uh, developer in the process. So with that, there were four major topics that were one of which was jobs, quality, and, and pipelines. Um, and that was really looking at how, again, we could ensure that jobs that are produced offer living wages so that the cost of housing, that finding that balance between jobs and housing and reducing the potential need for folks to commute long distances. Uh, we talked a lot about employment and business opportunities, again, that should benefit the local community and local residents. Uh, in particular, lower income residents. Uh, we talked about the new development should help diversify San Jose's economy so that all residents and all educational levels have, have an opportunity to actually work here. And then also the career pipelines and meaningful opportunities for existing residents and youth to find good jobs. And we'll talk a lot about some great ideas that came out of that process as well. Um, so what this really kind of boiled down to, we talked about potential solutions related to these desired outcomes, some of which um, included increasing capacity and strength of a range of, set of networks to, or sectors, excuse me, to network and collaborate and share resources with each other, so that again, there's that collaboration internally. Um, there was a thought about equitable innovation, so linking sector companies with middle wage opportunities, such as manufacturing. Uh, using responsible contractors, that came up a lot, and, and thinking about different ways and standards that could help guide that process. We had some ideas of watch groups, including responsiblecontractguide.com to ensure that good working conditions are available. <coughs> there's conversation about project labor agreements, 
um, and establishing terms of conditions uh, for employment, um, employing skilled craft unions through the construction phase, creating pipelines again to good jobs, including local apprenticeship programs, service labor agreements uh, to provide worker retention was also mentioned. Um, job training was one that came up often and giving folks an opportunity and resources to be able to grab good jobs that are generated. Again, working with the local workforce and that included access for teachers, for school employees, um, and particularly those that are working in high poverty schools or the highest poverty schools. And that there was a lot of talk about partnership between Google and others with school districts, an attempt to address the shortage of housing and creating the innovation um, for accessing funds and accessing financing and technical assistance. Um, let's see, it's a very long list. It's a fantastic list. We talked about uh, pipelines, again, between education, apprenticeship, trades and universities and community colleges, again, using the resources that are here locally and building off of that. Uh, again, the training programs were brought up. There was a few different, and it's in the notes that we'll share, but there's a few different resources available, including San Jose Works as a program for kids to gain access to tech and advanced manufacturing. NextFlex, which is a program that connects to manufacturing and R&D jobs, again, for high school level individuals, and then other training programs for mid-career individuals that are looking to transition into something new. Um, so, a lot of great information that came out of this individual topic, and we'll come back and we can discuss this with a group to make sure that we have it all covered, but then the three others that we covered, again, the education system, and you'll find we did the survey at the end, and you'll see kind of how these ranked, and education came up often as something that we really, really need to look into, particularly to support local schools with additional resources and innovation, um, recognizing there's a good pipeline to good jobs here locally. So really, instead of looking at Google or others to develop new schools, looking at how we can support what exists here locally. Um, so we talked about innovation, we talked about job training, we talked about uh, assistive technology in classrooms, of how to <coughs> increase the capabilities and access the students to technology, especially those that might be disabled. Uh, we talked about career ladders, uh, work to future programs that provide access again for youth, uh, early education, um, er early childhood education, including not only the education, but resources for families like having childcare for uh, working mothers and fathers that, that don't have it currently so that their kids could get the same educations that others would. Um, and that some of the potential solutions related to that, um, I just lost my place here. <coughs> I think, oh, here we go. Uh, we also talked about uh, leveraging Google platforms such as YouTube to address cyberbullying, how we could use, again, the resources that Google might have available, um, including uh, or increasing resources for restorative justice programs. And that was really peer mentoring or social innovations for those maybe troubled youth that are sometimes overlooked and giving them the resources to be able to uh, be an active um, participant in their schools. Again, a lot about partnerships and mentorship programs especially taking advantage of having uh, San Jose State University right here and how we can create that partnership to, um, again, give resources to, to the youth and, and others in the area. Uh, and then again, we talked a lot about the resources that come, could come through innovations and tech, excuse me, technology. Um, and we also, uh, one member referenced creating, potentially considering creating in lieu fees to support existing school programs. So again, not necessarily looking to create a new school, but actually create funding to help support the schools that are currently here and allowing the school system to use those funds the way they see fit. Um, that covers most of what I wanted to talk about for schools. The next was local businesses. There was a strong desire to mitigate impacts on local businesses to ensure um, that nonprofits and others that are experiencing rising rents and wages, um, they're uh, able to compete and stay in this space and stay local. Um, there was conversations with members of city staff uh, to look at what the city is currently doing, programs including business ownership space that connects 
immigrants and small businesses to resources and again other technology and skill training to give them the foundation to be able to stay here locally looking at again at support from nonprofits to connect to resources potentially preparing a community impact study um, to determine again the the influence between the housing and jobs balance to make sure that that we've got that right um, partnering local businesses such as those located on the Alameda um, through we talked about it a little earlier before but catering and events and organization and community centers and programs again giving folks the resources they need to to thrive and um, requiring we also talked a little bit about requiring a percentage of retail space to be subsidized for local small businesses there was examples brought up for example one market in San Francisco where a few floors of the retail or actually provide space for local restaurants. So thinking about examples that are out there, again, to help support local businesses here. Lastly, we talked through the value capture and agreements piece. And that was really um, agreements with Google to capture the value created by public decisions and reinvesting some of that money here again locally. And agreements as mechanisms to ensure accountability and bring in extra funding. Um, we talked a little about data needs, um, requesting Google to provide more data for the types of jobs that are created to make sure there's a, there's a good balance of a variety of jobs that are, that are located here in the city, again, to allow for a, a variety of, of workforce um, that would like to stay here. Um, funding could, be, could come in the form of community benefit agreements, development agreements, commercial impact fees. Uh, and, and, and again, the infrastructure assessment or district levy that we talked about earlier to provide funding for schools. And then under accountability, um, we talked about requiring Google to monitor the quality of jobs in development, maybe doing an annual report uh, to show that how or what type of folks they're hiring, are they hiring locally, what the wages might be, uh, and then including that data as kind of an ongoing resource moving forward. So, that was a lot of information that I went through very quickly. Do you want me to do this or do you want to go through the ranking? Should, yeah? So, staff, uh, after the two meetings with jobs, uh, the job solution groups, put together a couple list of ideas or potential solutions uh, and put them into two groups. Um, so, one, it are, from that, we then sent it out to the job solution group members to make sure they agreed that those two categories were uh, looked good and that we um, characterized the ideas appropriately. And then they uh, went through a ranking exercise where they were asked to rank the top uh, five or six ideas uh, based on what they see as most important. So we compiled the results and sent them out to you all before this meeting. Um, so here are the top five from that ranking exercise uh, in response to the question, um, things that Google and others could do as part of developing the Deer Don Station area. So maybe you can walk through the top five here. Thanks for the setup, Lori. That was great. So a lot of this you already heard me talk through, but th again, this is how they ranked when we went through the process. Um, the first one that came up was, was committing to responsible contracting standards to ensure that contract out jobs are good quality and fair and safe working conditions. Uh, that, was, that was one that was seen as important. Um, we also, second on the list was the, to protect labor agreements which establish the terms and conditions of employment for construction projects to help ensure quality job opportunities for local workers. Uh, that came up often in our discussions as well. Uh, another was to partner with local businesses in and around the Deardon Station area, again, through catering, events, and patronage to really give them the resources they need to work together. Uh, fourth was to provide worker retention to ensure service workers retain their jobs and do not face mass layoffs and building owners of future tenants change changes service pri providers during operations. That's a mouthful. Um, but again, it's to ensure that we have a process in place that allows folks to stay here and work here throughout the entire phase of the project development. And then adopt local hiring policy to provide jobs for, for residents. Again, it was very important for folks to keep this localized. And Lori mentioned this earlier, but we, we divided this into two groups. So this is one group of the potential solutions that were under 
what could potentially happen as part of the development of the Deardon Station area. And then the next was a grouping that included what programs that Google or others could help fund to achieve the desired outcome. So if it doesn't happen as part of the development, what they could fund to help support other community benefits that, that we've talked through. And this was the top list of the six that came out of that process. And one was funding for early childhood education and child care for low-income households. Next was to increase resources for pre-apprenticeship and apprenticeship programs in trade industries. So really, again, creating that pipeline for folks. Um, increasing a fee or levy to generate extra revenues for local existing schools to use as the district sees fit. As I mentioned earlier, creating funding to support locally versus thinking about creating new schools in the area. Increasing resources for local job training and high growth sectors such as construction, IT, manufacturing, healthcare, and business. Again, making sure that that's widespread for a vari variety of job types. Provide resources for restorative justice programming in schools, what we talked about, creating resources for maybe troubled youth and others to have access to the same resources. And then finally, to support partnership and mentorship programs through San Jose State Universities and other local colleges, take advantage of the, the risk, rich amount of resources we have locally and partner with those to continue to advance the needs of the community. So with that, I'm gonna ask First, those members that were on the in the job solution group, if there's anything you'd like to add or anything we missed or any additional comments you might have, and we'll start with Charlie. Thank you. Charlie Foss, San Jose State University. I was part of this group, and frankly, I had a really, really hard time coming up with two or three items that I could put on either of these two lists from the items that were mentioned here. Uh, <clears throat> to me, what we're trying to do as part of this committee, as I see our, uh, what we're supposed to do as part of the SAG group is look for what is it that Google can do or what is it any employer that's coming into downtown can do. When I look back at Adobe, I look at the Sharks, I look at Oracle, you could look at any number of big employers that have come into the downtown we didn't put any of these rules and regulations on them. And, and to me, I, I kind of think it's absurd to put these things up there uh, on Google. Now, that all said, Google's coming in and they're gonna be a big part of our community and I think we need to work with them. So I think there's some items that are up on this list that are appropriate, but I think there's many of them that <clears throat> you know, are wrong to be uh, tagging on to any, I won't say Google, but any employer that's coming into downtown, unless you do it to all. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie. Good point. Reginald? Um, I, was, I was traveling during this last meeting, but you, I, I, I thought we were discussing some diversity in contracting, not just jobs, but, but the businesses that, that live and work and pay taxes here. We wanted them to be integrated into this process all the previously unengaged business communities, the local and, and businesses that have not been in the mix. And um, I think that what we're doing is not just putting something on Google, I think, that what we're doing is shifting the way we do business in San Jose so that we can better affect and better, uh, better affect the citizens and the business climate and the living climate here going forward, right? So I don't see this as something we're doing to Google. I hope I'm looking at Google being a partner with downtown San Jose and the city of San Jose and Silicon mm -hmm. Valley so that we can shift the way we do stuff because what we have done in the past is really not working. Thank you, Reginald. Great point. Sarah? Sarah McDermott, South Bay Labor Council. I second that. I think that the point of this is to say, how can Google be a good partner? And my understanding is that Google's interested in that answer. So we should be providing them with the best list we can of how we think they can be a really solid community partner. I also don't think that we should be negotiating against ourselves. There's something Google doesn't want to do. I'm sure they're going to tell us that. But right now, I haven't heard anything from Google about what they will or will not do. 
So I don't want us to sit here and think about that. That's Google's job to tell us that. And I look forward to hearing from them. But the point here is for us to really say these are standards that we think would really make this great for San Jose. Great, thank you, Sarah. Jeffrey? Yeah, um, I think there was a lot of energy uh, in the conversations uh, over the two meetings. Uh, about looking at examples of, of things that have happened in other major developments uh, that involve public land, that involve you know, public infrastructure supports, uh, other kinds of uh, public decisions. Uh, a lot of interest in the model, for instance, uh, uh, in Oakland around the, uh, the Army base redevelopment where they had a community benefits agreement that you know, had a responsible contracting standard, that had a project labor agreement, that had worker retention, that had a local worker policy, hiring policy, that had investments in workforce development in underserved communities. And so I think there are more examples of how you can do this than examples of how trying to do this ended up in, in, in some kind of negative impact. Uh, so I think there's, there's really a strong rationale to move forward with these pretty strong set of, uh, of recommendations here. Uh, it was exciting to see, like, of the, of the top-rated pieces here, there is, there is a, there's a tremendous amount of energy around it. And so a lot of ideas that were floated, but uh, I don't think we should lose sight of these ideas around responsible contracting and job standards and really focusing on the kind of workforce investment uh, uh, issues that, that target our, our lowest income and most vulnerable populations. Great. Thank you, Jeffrey. That's a great point. And there are a lot of great models out there that we want to bring to light as a resource that we could be part of the comprehensive report at the end out that we, we kind of show the resources that are available, so models that the city and others could potentially follow. Were there any other comments from those that were on the job solution group? If not, any other comments from the SAW group in general? Any other thoughts you have on the, the job solutions that we came up with? Yes, Paul. Thank you. Paul Escobar with the San Jose Downtown Residents Association. Uh, one thing that I think would be interesting to explore, and I don't know if this is part of the conversation, is Google's unique strengths as a company and how those might be brought to bear here. So one area that, that comes to mind for me that I think is especially important and we should be thinking about as a community more generally is computer science education in our K-12 system. That is, as we think about how technology is changing our society and what it means for work, for any number of these things in the long term, it's important that students, the next generation, understand the technologies that shape our world. And that will happen with the K-12 computer science education. Google is already, as a company, invested in that. And that could be an interesting thing to leverage in some of these conversations. Great. Thank, thank you, Paul. You. Yeah, thank you. That definitely came up often uh, by taking advantage of the resources that Google has available. So thank you for heightening that again. Nathan. Great. Thank, Great, thank you. Uh, Nathan Ho from the Silicon Valley Leadership Group. Um, looks to be a very rich discussion. Just want to thank. Uh, those that took the extra time to uh, sit on this additional uh, committee to that, and thank you for, uh, for your input on that. Um, I, I just wanted to add that, that one thing that I didn't uh, see on the list was uh, the context of uh, jobs, um, that, uh, that we're very excited for the jobs to come. We're very excited for the opportunity for a very vibrant downtown, um, and that uh, just to understand, as, as Charlie put out there, um, that, that this is kind of new space. I uh, want to appreciate uh, Google and, and other large employers for being part of this process. Uh, this is uh, new for all of us, I think, as we've all learned uh, through the various uh, now seven meetings. Um, but I just want to commend uh, you know, the, the partners at the table. I think that's the word. You know, it, it's partnering going forward um, and, and really having a dialogue um, that this was something that uh, was not done uh, in the past in terms of, of robust community input. Um, and this is an opportunity for us to, uh, to have that conversation in the context of what's doable, uh, understanding that there isn't a project yet uh, to, to be negotiated, um, but that this is early input and as we move forward um, to, to look, at, look for those opportunities and be excited about it throughout uh, wherever we land. Great. Thank you, Nathan. We'll go to Madison and then Jeff. Thank you very much. I, um I mean, I, I think these, I think these standards, or whatever you want to call it, at some point, I think it will become standards are legitimate in terms of 
you know, this group as well as the general community are concerned with, with such a big corporation coming and potentially coming to downtown. But I have to agree with what Charlie Voss said uh, in terms of the rules and the implications and the hardships and all these challenges that we are talking about providing for a corporation. Yes, this is Google. This is a multinational, international corporations, and they have to go through all these uh, concerns that we have and challenges. But wh what if it's not Google? What if it's like a medium-sized corporations? What if it's another corporation? To look at the, what they have to go through as compared to Adobe or some of the other companies that have come to San Jose, um, it's quite challenging, even for a company like Google. So I think in the context of the city of San Jose wanting more corporations to come, not just to downtown, but to the city in general, we have to look at that. Also, I think we have to look at the optics of all this. We have not really showed that we want Google to come to downtown. Why is that? I, I think that if you actually go out there into the community, ask people in any particular community uh, for a company to come to San Jose, provide different types of jobs. It's not just, this is not just a Google factor. This is everything that happens if Google comes or another company comes to San Jose. We're looking at potential construction jobs, retail jobs, all the things that could happen because of a corporation coming to the city. So we have to look at all those aspects and impacts as well. And I don't think we really had a conversations around that. And then finally, I just wanted to say also, um, as a former elected official who actually served uh, here at the city of San Jose, we constantly want to go out and ask uh, taxpayers to approve bonds, measures, general obligations bonds so that we can pay for infrastructures and improvements in the city of San Jose. Imagine if we have a corporations like this or many corporations coming in, we can generate those tax revenues for the city of San Jose in order to channel that money to provide infrastructure improvements for our residents. We have to talk about those things. These are fine, but I think the, balance, the equation has to be balanced. We have to hear both sides of stories. I think more people need to speak up about the, not just the implications of Google coming to San Jose, but also the benefits that a corporations like this can bring to our city and to our residents. Great, thank you, Madison. Jeff? Hi, yeah, Jeff Rosé of Google. I just wanted to say thank you for this list and all this input. Uh, coming into this midway through, all of these uh, groups have provided some phenomenal input to this process, and I'm, I'm really impressed with the quality of that input. Uh, to Sarah's point, absolutely. We are here to listen, and that is still the mode that we're in until a project is actually moving forward and, and, and the negotiations are actually happening. So that's, that's not part of my job here. So I'm here to listen, take notes, and, and make sure that we're here to be a partner and be a good part of the community in general. And I, I think you know this is an exciting opportunity for everybody and especially for us as, as a participant in it, not just the, the catalyst, I guess. So um, with that, you know, I'll, I'll always be here and feel free to reach out to me. And Thank you for that, Jeff. Uh, Jeffrey, did you have additional comments yeah. before we wrap it up? Jeffrey Buchanan, Working Partnerships, he was like, hopefully folks had a chance to see in your packet, uh, there was a, uh, a Bloomberg article that was, uh, was attached uh, around the uh, a recent analysis looking at uh, Google's global workforce. And uh, uh, Bloomberg found half of Google's uh, workforce is actually contractors at this point, uh, which is, you know, something of a bit of a surprise. Uh, I, I, I don't think that's a particularly a norm for, for corporate America. But I think it just really highlights, I've, I've, we've heard some comments here tonight of should we expect, what should we expect of Google? Uh, we should be thankful for Google coming to San Jose. Uh, but I think we need to raise questions. There's not a whole lot we know about this project. There's not a whole lot we know about what kind of jobs will be coming here. Um, I think it really makes sense for us to have a robust conversation about things like subcontracting practices and what can we do to ensure that the kind of jobs that are created here aren't reinforcing this kind of uh, tale of two cities within the city of San Jose. If some folks that are doing very well and can provide for their family and, and take advantage of all that this great city has to offer, and some that are forced off into will continue working here and supporting our you know, most profitable businesses, but have to make their way to the Central Valley. And so I think it's really important that we stay focused on that issue 
and not get lost in this conversation about we should treat Google like any other developer. If there's another developer that steps up with a project that's 8 million square feet, that involves over 20 acres of public land around, you know, basically surrounding about half of our city's single largest uh, historical infrastructure investment, then, yeah, I, I, I think we should be having the same kind of conversation around that development. But for now, we're talking about this development because this is the single biggest project this city has seen and may ever see. And so I, I really push back on this idea that let's treat them like everyone else. Uh, they're just like any other small developer. You know, perhaps we need to be thinking about other large developments uh, happening in the DSAP and, and what we should be looking more than than, than what we have now, given the lack of a kind of system around value capture, the lack of anything like a uh, commercial linkage fee to actually pay for uh, the, the impacts when it comes to affordable housing. Yeah, we should probably do that too, but let's not back off. Uh, the, the, the problems are too big. The concerns of the community are too large. I, I, sorry for the monologue, but we, we engaged a thousand city residents here, taxpayers. I've heard that term thrown around today. And, you know, 80% of them said they want to see living wage jobs come out of this. You know, like 75% said they want to see Google invest and ensure there's no displacement. Uh, yes, people want to see Google come here, but they also want to see a good project. And I don't think the two things need to be, you know, put against each other. So let's, let's keep up the good work. I, not to be too negative, but appreciate all the, uh, uh, the collaboration and discussion here tonight. Great. Thank you, Jeffrey. Uh, looks like we have one last comment here from Edward. Oh, and Teresa, sorry, Teresa. I'll be brief. Uh, Edward Salm, Shasta Hancha Park Neighborhood Association. Uh, in listening to everybody, the thing I kept coming back to, one thing you put up at the beginning of every meeting, one of the, the kind of the rules and hopes is think big. Yep. Rather than ask for this much and end up with this, let's think on a grand scale and maybe ask for more than we will realistically get. But it's better to ask for more and get slightly less than that than ask for a smaller amount, and then wonder, well, what could we have gotten if we had asked more? If it was a developer or a potential business that wasn't being as open and wasn't being as communicative, talking about so many options might be counterproductive. But I think as long as Google is being as engaged as they have been on a variety of scales, from the individual neighborhood associations up through citywide, continue to ask for big things until it's time to get down to the nitty gritty. Don't, don't sell ourselves short and end up with a prog process that later we look back and say, what could we have done instead? Great. Thanks, Edward. Teresa. Yeah, I have a very similar comment. Um, you know, we're not going to litigate this on this committee. Our purpose is to provide input and our thoughts and ideas to the city council, who will then make this decision and move forward with the negotiation. So I think being as comprehensive as possible makes a lot of sense. I really appreciate Google's involvement, incredible amount of involvement not only in these meetings, but in the community, you know, being super visible, super engaged. And that collaboration is exactly what we as a city deserve and what this, I think, was gonna, is going to make this process successful. Um, it's, we've said it here before, but when we, uh, Spur, took a study tour to um, the Netherlands and France last year, one of the comments that just really resonated with us on the topic of collaboration is everyone will get less than they, ex than they wanted, but more than they expected. And that's what I'm hoping for. <laughs> Thank you very much, Teresa. So on that, oh, Harvey, Harvey, you're. Um, Harvey Darnell, <laughs> North Wilmington <laughs> Neighborhood Association. I sat on the uh, 2040 panel, the 2040 revision panel, um, geared on neighbor, good neighbors, et cetera, et cetera. And, and you know, what, what has occurred to me is that we're not just talking about Google. Google is, is the big elephant in the room because they're picking up about 60 acres of the 240 acres that we're looking at, but there are going to be other large players, maybe not quite as large as them, but I think we need to, to like the other speakers have said, we need to raise the bar uh, look at the issues that are going to come in terms of uh, displacement, uh, jobs that don't match the requirements for housing in the area, et cetera, et cetera, and uh, let all the people that are coming into this area know this is what San Jose needs. Frankly, we've in the past tried to do it out of the city budget and we failed miserably on 
uh, once the art redevelopment agency went away. Okay, thank you, Harvey. So again, I want to commend and thank the jobs group for taking the time to come to these meetings. That was a fantastic discussion. So again, thank you for your time. I'm going to give them a quick hand of applause. Thank you so much. And now we're going to get into the housing discussion. Kristen? Yeah. I'm going to have Kristen Clements from the housing division join me. So I'm going to jump right into desired outcomes because we did already do a preliminary report back from the housing solution group where we went into more detail on the uh, concerns and issues that the group uh, talked about as well as the specific desired outcomes. Uh, so in general, the desired outcomes fall into two geographic scales. One is uh, the localized immediate area surrounding the Deardon station. Uh, the focus on that is to discourage displacement, uh, including direct displacement from redevelopment, and to preserve the wide variety of homes and character that exists in the nearby neighborhoods. On a citywide scale, there's, uh, the group was talked about this a lot in, t in terms of this being a big opportunity to address the housing. Crisis. And while the city has existing programs and policies that help with that, they the group d said that we need more and stronger tools and encouraged us to be bold in addressing displacement and generating more affordable housing throughout the city. So the ultimate goal is for direct or indirect displacement from San Jose and no increase in homelessness. So the potential solutions that the group discussed fall into these three general categories. First is the ongoing role of the city and its partners, including many of you, uh, in addressing the housing crisis. Next are guiding principles for development of the Deardon Station area. So this is what uh, would apply to developers or development in the, uh, specifically within the boundaries that we're looking at. The third bucket kind of combines the two. Uh, it would apply to developers in the Deardon Station area, but think about how any new financial resources that are generated through development, how could those be applied at potentially a citywide scale to achieve some of these desired outcomes? So the first couple slides here show you uh, examples of the ideas that were discussed in terms of the role of the city and its partners. So the city is already working on many of these things through the housing crisis response work plan or the affordable housing investment plan. And they generally relate to uh, increasing the speed of which uh, housing is constructed, especially affordable housing. And it also uh, increases uh, or the city's looking at how to increase resources on how to um, preserve housing and incre uh, increase funding for the production and preservation of housing. Another category that the city's working on is preserving the existing stock of affordable housing. So this includes uh, housing that's subsidized and could potentially be converted uh, to uh, market rate and so investing resources to preserve the affordability of those units. Uh, the last subcategory here in terms of what the city's working on is uh, anti-displacement policies and tools. Uh, so an example of that is increasing Section 8 voucher acceptance among landlords. Uh, so the city's partnering with PolicyLink and several other cities nationwide to look at the effectiveness of anti-displacement measures. And so the ultimate uh, goal is for the city to come back later in 2019 with a plan that uh, reflects the work that they're doing with PolicyLink. So this next category here are the main ideas that the group discussed in terms of uh, principles that would apply to development in the Deardon Station area. So the group generally agreed that we need to maximize the high density housing in the station area. And at the third meeting we had, uh, there was a lot of discussion about this topic and wanting to make sure, um, you know, who was that housing intended to serve? Is it 
new employees of offices in the Deardon area, commuters. Uh, so the, the main takeaway from that discussion was that uh, the housing should be inclusive to both local workers and Deardon commuters, recognizing that being near Deardon Station uh, has a lot of value to people and should really uh, take advantage of that, both on the jobs and housing side of things. So uh, the next principle here is that any inclusionary unit should be built on site rather than um, being paid out as an in-lieu fee. Uh, this third item here is was a big topic of discussion in the third meeting. Um, what the uh, recommended uh, target for affordability should be for moderate, low, very low, and extremely low income residents. Um, so the idea is put out there to make at least 25% of those new units affordable, um, although a couple members did express concerns with the viability of placing that requirement on a single developer. So I'm sure there'll be more discussion on this uh, in the follow-up, so I'll leave it uh, at that for now. Um, so the other ones were related to avoiding direct <coughs> displacement if any housing uh, were to be redeveloped. And then looking at uh, requiring a developer to advocate for policy changes to strengthen tenant rights. Uh, the last item on this list is uh, to contribute resources to address the uh, housing issues and provide other community benefits. And so the group talked about the se several ways in which uh, this could play out um, from a process standpoint. Uh, the potential mechanisms for generating these new resources could be through a development agreement, a community benefits agreement, revenue from land transactions, and commercial linkage fee. So these are just some of the um, ideas that the group raised on, on the how question. Uh, the group also wanted to emphasize that uh, given the scale and uh, severity of the housing issues that the city should be looking at addressing those issues before finalizing the sale of land to Google and also to include mechanisms for capturing the value of any upzonings and transit investments through an agreement. So the housing group took a little different approach on the ranking exercise. It actually was um, pretty fun. We did it in person, um, kind of on the fly. They had a list of 11 ideas uh, and were asked to rank the top five. So this is the uh, results of that ranking exercise, um, beginning with, oh, and I should mention that these were our weighted results. Um, so not just the number of times an idea rose up in someone's top five, but we actually weighted the ones that received a, a one ranking higher than the ones that received a five ranking. So I can go through that in more detail if you want, um, but just to clarify, that was a suggestion that um, we got after the parks ranking group uh, was to rank them. So we tried that here. Uh, so with that, the top uh, strategy is to uh, use new resources to acquire land and build affordable housing in areas well served by transit. And during the third meeting, the group emphasized that that should include the station area itself, not, but it could also include other parts of the city. The next uh, highest strategy was to <coughs> acquire, uh, rehabilitate and preserve the affordability of existing multifamily housing with a focus on neighborhoods <coughs> at the greatest risk of gentrification and displacement. Uh, the group talked about uh, the use of data to identify those areas as well. Uh, the next one was to build high density housing outside of the Deardon station area, including the east side. So this is speaking to the fact that more housing is needed in San Jose in general uh, to address the citywide and regional housing crisis. The fourth one is a principle to uh, guide that new housing development and to look at ways to utilize community ownership models to increase home ownership opportunities, such as through using community land trusts. And the fifth one actually combines two ideas that received an equal scoring, but when combined uh, made it into the top five. Um, they're very related. Uh, but it's to increase funding support for organizations that provide legal assistance and education to tenants 
and a specific application of that would be to fund the legal defense of low-income tenants facing eviction proceedings. So I believe that is the last slide. Yep. So uh, there were many more ideas that came out of it, but uh, these were the ones that uh, floated to the top in terms of specific strategies to uh, consider. So thank you for listening. And uh, I'll open it up to the Housing Solution Group members first, just to... Uh, well, just, sorry, just real quick. I want to remind folks in the public, the next I agenda item is to have public comment. So if you haven't had a chance to fill out a comment card, please do so and hand it off to Lauren here. And then I'll go ahead and join me to facilitate this discussion for you. Okay, so we'll start again with those that were on the housing group that want to add additional input, anything we forgot, any praises for Lori and team for the great capturing of input. Yes. This is your chance. <laughs> Kevin, we'll start with you. Okay, yeah. It was quite a session of meetings. Um, it was very productive. But I just want to make sure that we put an asterisk on the ranking of these top five because, you know, when it says acquire land and build affordable housing, um, for those who weren't at the meetings and for my neighbors, they're going to probably wonder what in the world were you doing there, Kevin, uh, because this sounds like there's a potential to, quote, acquire the existing surrounding neighborhoods and turn them from, like, single-family residences and, say, R2 duplexes into... Uh, multifamily uh, dwellings. And I want to make sure that uh, we as a group uh, did say that we are going to protect the existing neighborhoods from this sort of thing because um, not everybody wants to live in high density housing. Some people choose to li live in single family residences and that is an important part of the housing solution for San Jose. Great, thank you Kevin. Thanks for that point. Jeffrey? Yeah, um, I guess uh, kind of building on, on Kevin's point, um, there's a point in here that says avoid direct displacement of any housing and um, uh, the slide uh, development of Dearden Station 1 of 2. Um, Jeffrey, they yeah. can't hear you. Oh, sorry. Sorry. The mic. sorry. Uh, apologies there, folks. Um, so I think what, uh, with that point, uh, we really wanted to say that not just directed displacement, but we should make sure there's a goal of, of zero displacement indirect displacement or direct displacement, that there should be a plan to really ensure that we're seeing zero displacement come out of this project uh, was a goal that uh, we had a, a, a pretty robust conversation around, but there was strong support for, even though it wasn't in the prioritization exercise. I, I hope that would be reflected. And then just a, a, a kind of clerical suggestion. Um, in future presentations, uh, I think it would make a lot of sense to have the ranking preceding the, the listing of policy solutions um, because there's some differences between the, the, the how you're listing the policy solutions and then to later do the rankings. It, it seems to imply early on like there was perhaps more energy around the uh, uh, A and B than, than C or D uh, when in fact we have a, a ranking that, you know, so maybe look at when you put this out and we put this to, to council that we first reflect those highest rating rated solutions and then maybe list the other solutions below so there's not confusion about where the energy was or where you know the priorities were of the committee thank you jeffrey good point yeah we want to make sure it's a comprehensive report out any other comments from those that were part of that solution group okay if not any other input from the saw group in general yes nicole I'm honestly starting to get a bit worried that there is a very well-connected, not in my backyard presence here on this committee. And so just like suggestion, bullet point number three, build high density outside of nearest Dawn Station, including the east side. It's so we can keep our nice single family homes here on the west side and build more densely on the east side. And I just want to say the loss on Alameda doesn't support that. We support housing for everyone at all ranges, especially here at Deardon Station. Thank you, Nicole. Pilar? Um, and so as someone who was on the Housing Solutions Work Group, um, I, I'm sorry I didn't, Nicole. I agree with that comment, and this was actually a pretty extensive conversation, and I raised this, and the idea that 
the verbiage um, on the bullet point has been consistent and is pretty exclusionary in saying that the housing is going to be built outside of Dardan. And the clarification that I got during when we were ranking and we were voting that that was not the intent. And if that's the case, that it, that's not the intent, then I would strongly encourage staff to reflect the record. Um, because this was not what I voted on when, and my understanding was this was not the intent that the group voted on um, when we were ranking. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pilar. Paul. Paul Escobar, San Jose Downtown Residents Association. Just bringing back into the discussion one of the points that came out of the forum that we had on August 2nd around the homelessness question and specifically around mental illness and, and substance abuse. Uh, I, I don't necessarily see that entirely reflected here. I imagine that discussion happened in the work group space, but I, I do think that's a really critical piece of this that should be folded in somewhere. Thanks, Paul. Leslie? Leslie Hamilton, Guadalupe River Park Conservancy. Um, we're in a housing crisis now, of course, and Google isn't. So Leslie Hamilton, Guadalupe River Park Conservancy. My concern is that we're in a crisis now, and we're talking about a development that's coming online in eight years. So I, I'm interested to see what can we, um, what can we capture from this process? Both, I, I know that from the parks group, for example, there were, there were recommendations, there were policies that came out that could be acted on now. Is there a way to call from each of these um, solutions groups policies that maybe the city hadn't anticipated following so that, that that comes as part of our recommendations to the council that we, things that we can act on now versus waiting for Google? Yeah, that's a great suggestion, Leslie. Definitely something that we're thinking about as we put the report together of how to look at short term versus medium and long term um, goals or priorities for the city to follow, so that is definitely something we're thinking about, so great point. And I'll, okay. I'll jump in here and Kristen can elaborate, but I would say this, a lot of people are paying close attention to what's being said at, this, at these meetings and the housing department is, you know, right there with us, so it's already shaping the work that, or I shouldn't say shaping, informing an ongoing effort. Um, so one of those <laughs> is the anti-displacement uh, work that's being, uh, with policy link that I mentioned. Hi, Kristen Clements with the Housing Department. I will just add that the housing crisis response work plan that the administration jointly has brought forward and back to council, um, we're gonna be reporting every six months on progress on that and some of the concepts like increase production, make development easier, look at certain policies, those are already things that the administration is working on. And so while the group is talking about it here, there are broad areas of overlap in the things that we would like to do already and that the council has asked us to work, look at as priorities. Thank you, Stephen. Stephen McMahon with the San Jose Unified School District. I think one of the themes that's been consistent with this group is diversity of opinions. And I agree with the point that we're trying to forecast potentially 30 years of the future right now today. And both of the solution groups that presented tonight mentioned fees. And I've mentioned this before, I do think that maybe the best path to satisfy all the diverse opinions and current desires is some sort of ongoing mitigation or impact fee that allows the city to respond to needs as they arise. The housing market is completely different now than it was 15 years ago, and it may be completely different again in 15 years. And is there a way to not capture a one-time solution with this development, but an ongoing way to have the city be in a place where it can respond to future needs because this once in a lifetime opportunity is generating some sort of mitigation or impact to address a future we don't know. And I think Jeffrey's brought up an excellent point that I repeat all the time. Whoever builds around Deardon is gonna benefit from hundreds of millions, if not billions of public infrastructure. There should be some way to offset the impact on the community. I'm just worried that if we try to do it now, in 10 or 15 years, we're gonna have missed something we wish we could do. And just very briefly, the school district has a system that's similar. There's a developer fee every time someone remodels their residential property or adds commercial development. We collect a developer fee that sits in account and allows the school district to adjust for school construction as we go through changes around us. And that fee is a little bit more nimble and flexible. 
and we collect it on an ongoing basis. So I saw both groups have that, and I think that is a better way to unify what are a lot of great comments in this room. Otherwise, I'm worried we'll not be able to reach a consensus and potentially not get an outcome that is sustainable for 20 to 30 years. Good point, Stephen. Thank you. We're going to go to Sarah and then to Kevin. Hi, Sarah McDermott, South Bay Labor Council. I just want to go back to the questions around the third bullet point because I was on the committee and now I'm a little confused. Um, so, I mean, I, I think we just need it clearer stated. I'm reading it currently as to mean um, that we're not just going to build high density housing in the Duradon area, we're going to build it elsewhere, including east side. Um, but I want to make sure that if that is what it means, that we're stating that more clearly, or if there's uh, other interpretations that we need to discuss. If I could interject, my recollection of those comments were that we would build high density housing in the Deardon Station area and, and not limited only to that area, and that other areas that are well served by transit. And we talked about that east-west corridor as one of the concepts of the d Google development about connecting the east and the west sides of the city as an example of a transit-rich area that could and should densify if it was near transit. So that's my recollection. Anyone else? Yeah, I just, I think we need to, it, maybe it just needs to be a longer bullet point, but um, I, I understand why people uh, are reading it the other way, so we should clarify it. Okay, we'll go to Kevin and then come back here to Harvey. Okay. Um, I think it was the beginning of this month I attended a Caltrans meeting that was over here in the uh, dome. And one of the interesting points that came out of that uh, meeting was the fact that in spite of what we're trying to do here, we're not going to, we have a housing crisis so big that even if we were able to enact all the things that we want to do now, we probably cannot keep up with the problem that we have. And I thought one of the interesting solutions to the problem, at least on a short-term basis, um, is the idea of having, I think what they called a safe tent city uh, that would allow people an, a, a place they could be while they're transitioning from being homeless to potentially finding uh, a more permanent uh, form of residence. And so I think as a group we should try to, I know that we don't have enough council members to encourage this sort of thing but I think we ought to start kicking some people in the butt that not we can't solve this problem overnight and that this might be a way of transitioning for some people in a humane way because what I've noticed in my goings to work I, I live and work in San Jose these these sweeps aren't working um, they are they are inhumane and I, I don't like what I see happening in this city in that regard. Um, it's painful to see people who want to have some place to live build some fairly innovative structures and then have them torn down just to show up again, you know, in two and a half, three weeks. So it's kind of a waste of resources, I believe, to continue yeah, continue to go this way. Um, so if we could have something that the city could sanction, it would certainly help in the short term. Thank you, Kevin. Harvey? Harvey Darnell North Will Lynn Neighborhood Association. Um, on point number three, um, the 2040 Envision uh, General uh, plan update task force struggled for four years and worked with city 
planners and, and uh, all kinds of consultants, is it not? And all kinds of consultants to find the places where high density housing would be appropriate. We call them now the urban villages and we're creating urban village plans and, and certainly the area around uh, Deardon is part of that, but there are other places along the corridors, along transportation, et cetera. So perhaps to assuage the fears of some of the people, we could include some verbiage pointing to the urban village uh, uh, language in the uh, general plan. Because it, it was looking for high density housing. Good suggestion, Harvey. Thank you. Maria Noel? <coughs> Maria Noel Fernandez with Silicon Valley Rising. I just want to say, I mean, one thing that I worry that we can easily lose is just the focus and the very specific element of that, yes, we absolutely need to be continuing to explore every possible tool in our toolbox and working with the city of San Jose and using our public policy tools, but ultimately, we also need to be very clear on what the role of Google is in all this. And I think what has come up in our subcommittees and I'm hoping, you know, in our conversations in our, with our base is that we are looking for a community benefits agreement that can actually do that. So yes, it's about the city of San Jose, but we need to be really clear and consistent that this is about also about and very specifically about what is going, uh, Google going to do to address these issues and what's their role in all of this. Thank you, Maria Noel. Yes. Uh, Nadia Aziz of the Law Foundation of Silicon Valley. Just want to echo what Maria Noel said. Thank you all for all of your work on coming up with some of the solutions that we need for the housing crisis. I just want to echo that it's happening now, and it's. Uh, I, I just looked at our, the d data from our office from the past three months about where people are getting evicted, and if you look at the top ten zip codes, they're all in the Derridan Station area. So displacement is happening, it's happening now, it's happening in, um, in the community that's gonna be affected by the Google development. So um, I just wanna thank everyone for their hard work, um, but again, we just need to do more, and we need to really emphasize that this should be part of a community benefits agreement with Google. Thank you for elevating that, Nadia. So if there aren't any other comments, again, thank you very much for your time. If we can give the group an applause for all the hard work. Thank you so much. So now we're going to transition. Don't look at that. We're actually going to transition to public comment. And as mentioned earlier, I'm going to read off at least the first five or six names. I believe most everyone is in the room. We got some comment cards from the outside. If you aren't here, please come in if you hear your name and start to line up here. And we'll put a mic here for you so you can have time for your comments. As a reminder, we have a two minute clock up there right in front of you. If you could please stay within that two minutes, we'd greatly appreciate it. So here we go. Uh, if Blair Beekman, Jeremy Taylor, Gail Osmer, Robert Aguirre, Sandy Perry, and Glenn Abrams could start lining up. Hi, uh, I guess I'm gonna go first. Uh, I wanted to speak on issues that were spoken about in the beginning of the meeting, so I guess this is appropriate. There was very nice ideas mentioned about the ideas from the first set of uh, slides you were showing that you want to possibly learn how to work those ideas within current models of the city of San Jose. Thank you very much for saying that. You're trying to offer some very good ideas and for this to be used within San Jose now is important. And that brings up the topic of the SJDA. And um, you know, I am a total beginner. I'm a total rookie at learning how to talk about uh, civic engagement. And um, I've not been in too, too impressed. I've not been too impressed with uh, how you've been working and your thinking. Um, you're ready to build a big, bright, new downtown San Jose and you are really excluding and like possibly ex trying to exterminate the, the, the homeless downtown population. And I'm really 
hurt by the, the technology you want to employ down there to basically spy on them and basically insult them and basically practice law enforcement on them that I feel is not the right way to go. The city of San Jose downtown, in my feeling, has an incredible tradition of, of really respecting its downtown and practicing good ideas and advocacy and you know social health programs, all the good stuff you know that we grew up with and it's just it's a tradition of downtown and you guys want to blow it away at this time by using technology to just wipe them out and I'm really insulted by the way you're working and I hope we can have a good long discussion how we're going to make that bridge to the future that is a proud tradition of San Jose to offer good communication and friendship to solve our differences thank you in the downtown area that's how we solve our differences thank, thank you, you. Thank you. Is Jeremy not here? Okay, we'll move on to Gail Osmer. Well, I hope not everybody, I uh, hope everybody comes back when it's public comment. Um, okay, uh, my name is Gail Osmer, and um, there are many, many wrongs with this whole Google project, starting with the displacement of hundreds of families. But the worst is displacing, like Paul said, and talked about the mentally ill, the Julian Street Inn. The Julian Street Inn has been on the corner of Julian um, behind the stadium for over 30 years, and there are homeless, mentally ill people living there. Now, I don't know what's going on, but they are gonna be selling it. And so what are they gonna do? Be more homeless on the street? That's what we need, more homeless, since we'll be getting a lot more homeless with this whole Google project. There has to be an alternative that before they shut down the Julian Street Inn, the owners have to be held accountable and build another shelter for the mentally ill like they have now or find permanent affordable housing. And that should all be done and put to bed before they close the shelter. This is really an injustice. I don't know what they're gonna do, but they can't, if they close it, they have to have housing or another shelter. Also, I don't hear anything about senior affordable housing. There are old people like myself that are, no, I'm, I'm not, but gonna be displaced. We need affordable or low income housing for seniors. Thank you. Thank you, Gail. Next up is Robert, followed by Sandy Perry. Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, I'd like to address a couple of things that I think. Uh, first of all, Kevin, I want to thank you very much for your mention of the, uh, the houseless people and the, the problems that we're experiencing with them. Uh, I see once again a representative for the houseless, Shannon Alloway, is gone. I haven't heard any input from him. I don't know if he's done anything in writing or whatever, but uh, we don't really have true representation. The houseless people have representation at this table if we don't have somebody that's here and it speaks up for us. That's the voice that we're being robbed of. Okay, so another thing is that I wanna talk about is how um, the, the number of homeless, houseless people that are living outdoors right now in this exact area and how we're going to treat them. Now I know that uh, their Second Street Studios is a place where they're putting people from St. James Park, but there's a lot more people in this downtown area that are being affected. I, I like the idea of the sanctioned encampment. I've been talking about sanctioned encampments for a long time. Um, one of the problems that the city tells me is that they can't find a neighborhood where they would allow them to be. I think we have some areas that are in the Google area that are already zoned for uh, residential, and it would be nice if Google set aside a couple of acres at least where we could take the people and put them in there and provide tents for them, uh, a temporary situation so that they could be there until permanent housing becomes available, as Kevin pointed out. And this is something that I've been talking about for uh, two and a half years with the city, and they refuse to even think about the idea of doing that. And they're bringing forth this idea of bridge uh, housing communities, which is a small step because it only helps out 1% of the houseless people in the city of San Jose. What about the other 99%? Okay, so 
I think that this is something that we should really consider, and I think Google has an opportunity to be able to allow us to have a place for people to be able to exist until permanent housing is available. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. I'm gonna go ahead and read off the next five names so we're ready. It's Sandy Perry, Glenn Abrams, Andrew Kane, Diana Salazar, and Juan Salcedo. Hi, good evening. In Silicon Valley, apparently, there's two kinds of people. There's uh, those who are considered the favored ones and those who are considered disposable, who can be displaced. No responsible urban policy policymaker, scholar, professor, advocate is in favor of displacement or says it's a good policy. Displacement destroys communities. It disrupts culture. It tears families apart. It damages the environment. It ruins people's quality of life. And it undermines economic opportunity. It increases inequality. And it increases homelessness. I still see no indication from either Google or from city staff that they intend to take any action to stop this displacement from happening. It's incomprehensible that this body would endorse a project that will increase displacement. And in fact, I am specifically asking you as people of conscience to take a vote to recommend that city council not sell or lease any land to Google without a guarantee that it will not cause displacement. San Jose already has op the reputation that it's a city that tells its low-income people to get out. Every newspaper article on displacement has comments down at the bottom saying, just get out, just leave. We even had a Sunnyvale City Councilman, and this is, it's not just San Jose's problem, it's, it's Silicon Valley. A Sunnyvale City Councilman person told people to get out if they don't work for the tech industry. Surveys show that most people in San Jose blame the tech companies and the real estate developers for the housing crisis, and if anybody should get out, it should be them. Thank you. Next up is Glenn Abrams, followed by Andrew Kane. Um, hi there, my name is Glenn Abrahams. I was born and raised in Santa Clara County, graduated from San Jose State. Um, I'm a father and a homeowner in the Robertsville area of San Jose. And um, I'm also, I guess, what you'd call a tech worker. Kind of odd to say out loud, I don't think I ever have. Um, I've seen the city, I've seen this whole area dramatically change over 40 years, 40 plus years. Um, and I'm scared about the pace. Every day in my neighborhood, I see it change, and I see people on the street. I'm, I worry about those low-income residents and those experiencing homelessness that I see everywhere around. It's bad now. I worry about the city that my son will grow up in and might lack the cultural richness and economic diversity I see disappearing today, every minute. Google will pro most likely be part of our community. But it's more than that, it's more personal. Google will be our neighbor. So what I'd like to see is Google and the city work together to fight displacement, find ways of more affordable housing for low income, very low income people, and hiring from this community, obviously both tech jobs, but for all those other jobs that support, support a large company. Um, I also, and I'm looking at the clock here, um, I take transit pretty much daily at Deeradon and Tamian. It's really difficult. I get up, I'm at the station usually at 6.30. If I'm there at 7, I can't find parking spaces. I stand every day and luckily I'm able to. Um, it is hard to take transit. It is very hard for the disabled. It is a problem today and it, I see the problem getting worse. So I hope that Google who ha will have an impact and I'm not opposed to change. I've seen it all my life. But I want that change to be positive and I think that Google can be a great partner and can be a great neighbor. And I hope they step up and they do so. Um, and I also think that, that we need to have built into this process the oversight to make it happen. Thank you, Glenn. We have about 25 to 30 folks that want to speak, so I greatly appreciate you sticking to the two minute, and that's been great so far. So now we have Andrew Kane followed by Diana Salazar. All right, Andrew had to leave, so we're on to Diana Salazar. Good 
Good evening, SAG members. My name is Diana Salazar. I'm an organizer here at Sacred Heart. You know, uh, I've been really skeptical of this process from the beginning. I feel like there's an imbalance of power, and it's still unclear how any of these meetings will shape the decisions that Google and the city will ultimately make. But here we are again, right, uh, sharing our concerns, still looking for answers. I was at one of the community meetings held earlier this summer, and one thing was certain. People know this project will displace us, us working class renters. We don't even, we couldn't even answer half of the facilitators' questions because it assumed that we will still be here. And for the city to then insinuate that we won't be displaced because of all the protections renters have was honestly a slap in the face. Not only because it misled the audience to think that all of the protections that they had applied to all renters, but also because the community made those protections happen, not the city. We fought for those rights, just how we're here right now fighting for our right to be here. This past July, I joined a national assembly of 300 other tenants, organizers, allies, and all others that believe hum housing is a human right and not a commodity. We shared, learned, and worked together to find all kinds of solutions to this flawed housing and economic system. Before the conference, I honestly did not know that development without displacement was even achievable. But after meeting community leaders that made it happen in their own cities, I think that that ask of you tonight is not far-fetched at all. But it could only happen if the decisions that are being made are made by those directly impacted. So I hope tonight is the night to be critical of this development and its impacts it might have on our public schools and housing crisis. We must never prioritize profits and the aesthetics of a building over people's dignity and right to shelter. If Google, the city, SAG, the community as a whole cannot uplift renters, the working class, people of color, houseless, the elderly, non-tech workers, low-income bus riders, and all those trying to survive here, then we should never support such a development. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. I'm going to read off the next five again. So we have Juan Salcedo, Bill James, Amanda Hawks, and Ted Smith. Buenas noches a todos. Mi nombre es Juan Salcedo. Vi he vivido en San José por 41 años y no quiero moverme de aquí porque es mi segunda patria. Es, es mi patria aquí y al moverme de aquí, pues no, no sé qué sería de mí. No, y por eso queremos ponerle presión a Hugo que nos ayude para con la crisis de la vivienda. Y así se evitaría tanto con les delinquencia. Okay, I'm going to translate for Juan. Uh, I have lived, uh, my name is Juan Salcedo. Good evening. I've been living in San Jose for more than 41 years. And I can, I can afford to move to another place. I have two jobs. I love living in, being in San Jose. And if you guys uh, put pressure on Google, uh, we can avoid more homelessness. And Google can help to resolve the crisis that is going to be worse for housing. Thank you. Thank you, Juan. Bill James, followed by Amanda Hawks. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Bill James. I am the chairman of the Santa Clara County Democratic Party. We're a uh, party of four, almost 400,000 voters here in Santa Clara County, representing nearly half of the registered voters in the county. I want to uh, draw a picture of you uh, it, for you. If you haven't done it yet, members of this group, I encourage you to do it. Go down to Palo Alto downtown, start at uh, Palm Avenue there by Stanford, where a lot of Google engineers are trained, and drive down El Camino Real south all the way to Shoreline Boulevard in Mountain View, make a left, and proceed all the way to Google's campus. You will see that that route is literally lined with recreational vehicles in which people are living for the lack of housing uh, options for them in those areas. And the shocking thing that we found is that the, the residents there are not, are not homeless. They're, they're out in tent communities and improvised communities. Many of them are Google engineers and employees and contractors or contractors and, and employees of other tech companies. This is the future that you risk for San Jose if you're not careful to get required behavior and cooperation from the company as a part of this deal. I've heard tonight concerns expressed about the magnitude of the project, and it's a great project, but they will bring a lot of issues that you'll need to address. 
I want to let you know the Santa Clara County Democratic Party has joined with Silicon Valley Rising through a resolution brought to us by youth delegates and passed by the Central Committee. The Santa Clara County Democratic Party supports Silicon Valley's rising advocacy and outreach to represent community interests and hold tech companies accountable for their role in economic inequality, displacement, and gentrification. I'll be sure to provide the full resolution to the uh, staff of the group. I ask you to please ensure that there are required behaviors over time that can be enforced through an enforceable agreement. The company may do good things as a good citizen. It will do that which it's required by agreement to do. Okay, I'm gonna read off the next five again just so we have it. Amanda Hawks, Ted Smith, Jeremy Taylor, Hugh Tr Tron, and Karen Hedges. Good evening, I'm a, a long-term resident of San Jose, I'm a grandma, and I am a lawyer, and I'm here to talk about one of the things that uh, concerns me about this, the issue of, we're gonna get this fixed, because we've been, to this, we've been through this before, 20 years ago when um, Anderson Dam overtopped Coyote Creek flooded. Duh, that's what happened. Uh, there were public meetings, the city promised <laughs> They promised everybody it would never happen again. They promised the folks at Rock Springs. They promised everybody in Olander, never happen again. In a way, that was true, because what happened last year was a thousand times worse. Memories faded. People decided, well, we think we have this covered. It was a serious problem, and it made a lot worse. What it, among other things, it made homelessness worse. It made the affordable housing shortage that was at a crisis stage that much worse. Um, I represent people who have moved because they cannot afford to live here. They lived here for 20 years. They couldn't maintain, they went through all the stress and turmoil and had to abandon a community they love. That means lengthy commutes, disruption of the children, all the things that you would not wish on anybody, I hope, but continue to happen. And if we don't have this problem fixed, we're gonna be sitting here in 20 years. No, I won't, you won't. Somebody will say, what were they thinking? They weren't thinking hard enough and they weren't prioritizing. No displacement means no displacement. Thank you. All right, Ted Smith followed by Jeremy Taylor. Good evening, I'm Ted Smith. I live on South 15th Street. I moved to San Jose in 1972 directly out of law school. And the reason I moved here is because I wanted to live in a community that I thought was livable, that had good schools, that had nice communities, that had nice neighborhoods. I have rented and owned homes in several different sections of downtown over the last 40 plus years. Uh, we were able to buy a house originally in 1974 for $24,000. Uh, as our family expanded, we sold that house and bought a bigger house for $150,000 in 1987. That's what it was like in my living memory and in the living memory of many of the people in this room. Those days are long gone. Um, and during the entire time that I have lived here, I have just seen this city struggle with the issues of sustainability. And by that, I mean affordable housing, really good schools. Um, our kids all went to school here, and I think that they got a really good education, and I'm really glad of that. And our two of our kids went to college locally here, too. It can be a really good community, and I think this project could be a project that could actually enhance the quality of life here if it's done well. But it could also really ruin it, and this, this downward slide of lack of affordable housing could get much worse. Um, I think it, we're lucky in a way that we're talking about Google and not some of the other tech companies here. It is true that they say do no evil, and I think that we can hold them to that. I think your job is to come up with as bold and visionary a plan as you possibly can to put out there talking about all these different issues. We can have the best possible housing plan here. We can have the best possible parks in the country here. Google can afford to support any of that. I disagree, by the way, with the comment that was made earlier that we should treat this plan the same way as we treat everything else. That would be like treating building a nuclear power plant and having the same regulations as we have for or building a campfire and having the same regulations as we have for a nuclear power plant. This is qualitatively different than anything we've had before, and I think we need to take that and make that and turn that to our benefit. Thank you. Thank you, Ted. Jeremy Taylor. 
Well, there are a lot of people here speaking. Um, one thing I noticed, though, is no one complaining is actually from my neighborhood, which I would argue is going to be most impacted by Google. So it's really easy. The G for Google, you just remember Gardner. And that, too. So as the gateway of Willow Glen, Gardner neighborhood is actually the perfect neighborhood for Google. When Google employees move there one day, they'll be able to walk to downtown San Jose and Willow Glen. We've got a huge park, a community center, even a pool. You can get to trails for the bike. You can get to highways 280 and 87. And most of all, we have huge lots, which I'm sure one day might become really big houses on big lots. The reality is that one day Google employees will be able to walk five blocks from my neighborhood to get to their office. Our neighborhood is mostly ignored by our local leaders, uh, not to call anyone out. And we think that there's a lot um, that could be done before Google employees come so that we make it better. I've heard people say that Google is not breaking ground for five years and therefore we don't need to pay attention. Well, the reality is now my neighbors are already being forced out. I can introduce you to someone who works two jobs, who literally comes to tears the second you mention Google. He said if his rent goes up another dollar from the 3500 it's already at, he's out. We don't want to prevent Google from coming, but we want to do two things. We want to minimize the damage for residents that will be displaced from Gardner, and we also want to make this place better for when Google employees come. So what I request is the city of San Jose and Google work together don't just hold a meeting, Gardner, talk to residents. Don't just talk to the city leaders, talk to the people who might not speak English that are going to be forced out, that are already being forced out. The reality is the Google and the city of San Jose have the ability to make things a lot better, and unfortunately it's not happening today. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. I'm going to read off the next five names again. Hugh Tron, Kathy Hedges, Lucy Moran, and Karen Gillette. Good evening, group members. My name is Hui Tran. I've been in San Jose since 2001. Uh, first off, I don't know how you guys can stay in here for this long. It is hot. Um, you know, and, and it's a, I bring that up actually in relation uh, to, I had to devote some of my time here to talk about just planning. Uh, this is my first SAG meeting. Um, this is an incredibly huge issue that needs need to be addressed and encourage participation um, for residents. Uh, and this room wasn't it. I was in here, I had a spot. I walked out for a brief moment to find out if there was gonna be an overage room. I couldn't get back in. Um, I mean, I think considering the size of SAG is already 30 people and there were 75 people outside there at, at one point, this meeting should not be held in here anymore. It should be in the council chambers or just somewhere that can accommodate a lot more people. Um, now, uh, I also serve on the Housing Commission uh, for the City of San Jose, but I speak here today in my individual capacity. Uh, one thing we recently learned was that in the past year alone, 10% of the renters in San Jose received eviction notices. 10%. Now that number is not going to go down without a solid, detailed plan when uh, Google creates its campus and is going to bring in 20,000 additional people. I don't think people here are opposed to Google. They're opposed to Google without a plan. So um, now, being outside, I got to see the slides. They looked nice. Uh, you know, I wasn't able to hear much about it. But I think the question I want to leave with you all here as you're thinking about jobs, education, housing, um, think about accountability. Because at the end of the day, this is just advisory and recommendations. I would really hope that all the great ideas you put into those slides actually get put into action. And if they don't, what can we do to hold the city and, and Google accountable? Thank you. Thank you, Huey. Catherine Hedges, followed by Lucy Moran. Okay, we go to Lucy Moran. Good evening, everybody. Um, my name's Lucy Moran, and um, I've been a renter and a homeowner. Um, I came to San Jose in 1962. I was a little girl. And I grew up in Willow Glen. And um, I was the only brown child in that school. But that's okay. Diversity is great. 
immigrants make this country a better country. The American dream was buy a home, raise a family. That was the attitude we used to have. And go to school and get a great education and have a better job or better opportunities. But the housing crisis has caused that to kind of wonder where it all went. Investing, greedy investors, developers, forgetting about homes, families, home sweet home, and children and elderlies. And we're all going there one day. One day we're going to a care facility and we need to think about Who's going to take care of us? We've got to think about that. We haven't addressed that. We need to think about love makes the world go round. God is love, and we need to think about one another. Remember, God is trusting in God, and God is loving one another, and what happens to others could happen to you. So think about the families that are out there. We don't need that. We need solutions, and that solution is you can make a difference today. Remember what the other one said. What are the grandchildren going to say about us? What were we thinking when Google came here? Was it here as a partner to make this community a better community for all of us? Changing lives for the better? You can make a difference. Think about that. Every one of you today can make a big difference. Okay? Families count. Keep the families in San Jose. Thank you. Thank you, Lucy. I'm going to call off the next five. Karen, by the way, I... Greatly apologize if I'm mispronouncing your name. Thank you for clarifying when you get up here. Uh, Karen Gillette, Rebecca Arola, Phil Johnson, and Phil Mastrocola. Hello, my name is Karen Gillette. Uh, I am uh, retired now, and I'm a homeless advocate. Uh, my church is Trinity Cathedral in downtown San Jose. Very difficult to get in uh, to see my council member downtown. Um, I'm not a part of Facebook or anything like that, so it's hard for me to, you know, connect to the group. So before I go, I'm going to leave Paul my contact information because I'd really like to get more involved in this. Um, did I say um, not only do I live downtown, uh, my church is right off of St. James Park. It's Trinity Cathedral. Uh, it was built in 1863, so if we want to talk about history, I uh, worked uh, with the archives at our church and uh, try to help people in St. James Park. I'm also part of Winter Faith Collaborative. Uh, we do what we can as volunteers for homeless people here. Um, I think tonight I've been concerned to hear that it seems like we're asking this, the Google rather than the city uh, to solve all of our problems, or many of our problems downtown, and I don't think that that's, that's fair. Uh, I do a lot of traveling, I enjoy traveling, and if I go to a city like London, England, um, I don't have a problem finding a restroom. For some reason, in downtown San Jose, it's very difficult to find a restroom that, that you can have access to, could we please, I, don't, I think it should be the city that should look into, and maybe you can take this back to Raul, um, you know, I don't know why. Uh, it's so difficult for us to figure out this issue, okay, with restrooms. Um, and, and I think that we, we should not forget our low income and homeless uh, housing uh, when we're thinking about planning. But again, uh, I don't think it's fair to leave uh, or ask Google to solve all of our problems. Uh, we're taxpayers, many of us, and I think that the city should be stepping up to solve some of our problems. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Rebecca, followed by Phil Johnson. Good evening, my name is Rebecca Ariola. And I work as a barista at a tech company here in San Jose, and I reside in Eastside San Jose. So this is a city I was born and raised in. I left college for a while, but I returned back to live with my family in order to make paying my student debt more affordable. San Jose is the only hometown I have known and can't imagine making a future my, for myself in any other city. My fear with this Google project is that it will make it harder for me to build a future of my own in the only city I, ca I can call home. I am from Eastside San Jose, and being displaced could be a reality for me and the people living in my community. I want answers from Google about what they are envisioning for housing. I hope this committee and the city of San Jose will uphold strong housing standards for the project and ensure Google make firm, detailed commitments. 
I'm counting on you to protect the future of our community. Thank you. Hi, my name is Phil Johnson. Uh, I live on uh, North 4th Street. I recently moved back to San Jose from the East Coast. I lived in San Jose for 30 years. It's where we raised our kids on South 16th Street. My wife and I moved there in the late 60s when the department stores were moving out to Valley Fair and a lot of uh, absentee landlords were renting to homeless people and collecting, not homeless people, sorry, mentally ill people and collecting their uh, state checks. So there were problems at that time. But what I liked about San Jose and our neighborhood, and particularly in Nagley Park, was there was a lot of economic diversity, ethnic diversity, professional people living alongside working class people. People could afford the housing at that time, whether they were renting or buying. There were a lot of uh, young uh, couples coming in and rehabbing houses. And it was a wonderful environment for the kids to grow up in, regardless of the fact that there were a few crazy people wandering around in the streets. Nothing like what I see now outside uh, my apartment building on uh, North 4th Street. What I'm worried about is uh, I don't want this to become a company town. Uh, the United States has a long history of having large corporations uh, basically sort of purchase towns and then everybody's dependent on them. Uh, it kills small business. It uh, totally changes the uh, community uh, profile. Uh, instead of uh, a, a variety of people, diverse population, uh, number of different ethnicities, and uh, people of different economic backgrounds, and uh, working at different types of jobs, it moves everybody, it, it excludes everybody who, who doesn't have a lot of money, wealth, and power, basically. And that's what gentrification is. Uh, it's, it's occurred throughout uh, cities in the United States, currently in Seattle. I don't want to see people be excluded and displaced and only the very wealthy and affluent uh, be able to live in downtown San Jose. Thank you, Phil. So the next few names are Phil Mastrocola, Rebecca Moeller, David Lopez, and Daniel Gonzalez. I am Phil Mastrocola. Thank you very much, uh, Dave and Lee, for organizing this. And uh, I am pleased to be here um, because I believe this is an opportunity for us here as a community, a San Jose community, to make it better. Um, I represent, I'm the co founder of uh, Housing for All Alliance. We advocate for the unhoused folks in Santa Clara Valley, which is a growing population, as you probably know. In the county, we count 7,400. It's really, trust me, and some of the advocates and agencies who have counted people, it's closer to about 25,000. Uh, I have a personal connection in this area uh, because I was born on Sonoma and uh, San Fernando, went to school at St. Joseph's Elementary School. Uh, my first job was at uh, Del Monte Plant 51. My parents had a, uh, a, uh, a business on the Alameda for 35 years. So it has impacted me, but I'm privileged. And what I hope to see, irregardless of Google, is that we as a community address the issues that we need to address. When I retired, I said, I'm gonna give back and make this a better community. Little did I know I'd be dealing with a, such a vexing problem. I thought we'd be building wonderful things and, and, and doing great things and, and, and engaging community, not solving these problems. But if we're able to address the issues of Costa Hawkins, of the legal defense uh, for evictions, uh, for uh, funding subsidies, if we're able to do things like uh, the green print uh, process has and get those things done in this city because Google is here now and waiting for us to, to welcome them, then God bless this process. But I don't hear a process yet that we have come together on where we're together and we have coalesced and we have consensus on anything and I hope and tonight I will pray that we have that after tomorrow. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Phil. Rebecca Moeller, followed by David Lopez. Good evening. Uh, I am a new resident of downtown San Jose. I came here to work on some high-rise projects. Um, I've been here for about a year, and I've found a wonderful sense of community. Um, the first site I had to clear was full of homeless encampment, and so it really brought to light the fact that we have a problem. And I've dealt with homeless in New York City, um, someone who started a program called New York City Relief. And so I had some firsthand experience. Uh, I, I, I look at this opportunity as one to take models from other cities and apply it to our city. And, uh, and also I look at the cost of construction and wanting to build affordable housing. Without subsidies, we can't build affordable housing. It's impossible. Uh, since I've been here, I've grappled with being able to get projects to pencil. Uh, the, the rooms aren't getting bigger <laughs> in order to be able to do that. And so on a master plan, I look at, I'm also a fan of data and uh, evidence-based decision making. And I think that we have an opportunity with Google as our partner to help understand what the problems are. And instead of just bullet points, that we could actually map this and integrate the data so that we can use on it and understand the dynamic of what's happening in our city and what, what will happen just because we have a mega center of transportation for our city. And that will bring a lot with it. But I will say the opportunity of Google is a really great one because I think they could be a good neighbor to us if we can really get our heads around and let them help us get our heads around the problems and the, the opportunities that we have and how to solve them properly. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. So the next few names, David Lopez, Daniel Gonzalez, Sarah Elzani, and Bill James. Good evening, my name is David Lopez, former president of the National Hispanic University here in San Jose, uh, former professor of education and a teacher. And I come before you to s share a few words on your education agenda. I had the opportunity to read the minutes. I couldn't be here for the presentation earlier. Uh, but I can tell you, as someone said before me, this opportunity is qualitatively different. I have dedicated my educational career to looking for bold and innovative ways to address the challenges of educating the underprivileged, the undereducated, and the under-resourced, especially people of color. And I can tell you, you have some nice ideas that you're suggesting. There are some great institutions that you've identified. I've worked with them. But I can tell you, Google presents a tremendous opportunity where they can marshal their immense technological and human resources to this area to help us create a bold and innovative po prototype in this community to educate those kids that we really haven't done a good job with. And those are the majority. As I was standing out there, because I couldn't get into this meeting, the protesters had their children sitting there. If we work bold and in an innovative way and, in toge and together, we can make sure that those children out there receive the education and have the teachers and importantly, the ecosystem that Google can help us with their technological advances to create that prototype that will help them become the educated workforce. But I will underscore, bold and innovative, let's not look at what we've had in the past, what we currently have, and think it's gonna give us different results. That will not work. So I hope you're thinking bold, innovative, resourceful. Thank you for your time. Thank you, David, and thank you all again for being so respectful by staying in the two minutes. We have Daniel Gonzalez, followed by Sarah Elzani. Hello, my name is actually Daniel Gonzalez. Um, seriously, though, can we turn on the AC? Like, y'all are making me think you don't want the community to, like, be here. Uh, it's getting really uncomfortable. Um, I, I want to ask a question. Who remembers the vote to bring Google here on whether we should even have this conversation? Anyone? 
That's right, it didn't happen. The conversation on what to do with public lands should begin and end with solutions of the people. We did not, inv we did not invite Google here. This is pointless. If you wanna know what all this leads to, drive to Mountain View, go to Rengsdorf Park. There's a line of RVs as far as the eye can see. You'll find a little boy there, he's two years old, he's, he's autistic, he spends his day swinging in a net by his RV. Look at Seattle. The city tries to pass taxes, Amazon submarines them. For my friend uh, who asked about why uh, downtown hasn't taken off, I'll tell you why, it's because it hasn't been given to the people. If you want to preserve culture and history, the creators of that culture and history must lead. Anyone, is anyone here willing to give a presentation about culture and history in San Jose? Also, stop, stop with the discussion about coding programs for, for poor kids. Like I know, everyone knows, that is just a tech-driven initiative to suppress wages. Who all appointed you? This, this whole conversation is perverse because you cannot pretend to re represent the community because if I walk outside, I can find you thousands of people who have no idea what's about to hit them. And it's not jobs. It's gentrification, it's displacement, it's pain. If any of you are really from here and care what happens, you will not continue this lie. You will abdicate your place in this committee. Those of you on this committee deceiving your constituencies, doing damage by continuously um, saying that there's, light at any, there's any light at the end of this tunnel, stop doing phony polls, saying that it's about jobs, and then, tell, and then using those people to uh, say that San Jose welcomes Google, because it's not true. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and read the final five members. We have Sarah Elzani, Ayani Mokarala, Vera Slaku, again, I apologize for mispronouncing, Liz Gonzalez, and Roland. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Sarah Elzani. I go to community college. Um, I'm not a great public speaker, but uh, I've noticed a lack of trust between community members and the history of this particular city government um, to emphasize renters' protections, um, and particularly to pass um, capping the amount that landlords can increase rent every year to the amount that communities has, have asked for um, to respond to the urgency of the housing crisis. I think that the only way to deal with the housing crisis isn't to use Google's money, but to, um, to work on just cause evictions and the housing issues that we've been discussing um, for years with the city council. Um, and it seems very irresponsible to build and develop in this area when we don't already have um, like those um, policy measures in place. Um, and I think that um, I do not support Google building in San Jose at all and developing at all in San Jose because there's no policy solution that will neutralize the displacement of families and particularly immigrant families from San Jose. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah Ayani, followed by Vera. Good evening, folks. My name is Ayane. I am a student of Santa Clara County. I am also unhoused because of the property costs that are going up. And I'm very concerned because I love technology. I think technology is great and it can be used to help the people, but that is not what's happening here. Google has, a, has dominated technology markets and they're, what they're about to do by coming into San Jose is another example of corporate capture of the commons. And there is no solid plan on how is this going to help the people. First of all, the people don't even want this. Um, as Danielle has mentioned before, where was the vote that even like determined that they should even pr like there should even be a prospect that they're coming in? That did not happen. And San Jose is a city with a lot of culture and a lot of history. And the only thing that's coming out of this is a lot of displacement. And it's going to happen because it has already happened in a lot of places in the world, including the US. Here in the Bay Area, San Jose is one of the most expensive places to live in. It is the third most expensive city in the world. 
in terms of rent costs. And I think that's outrageous. It has not been like that. And we don't want to build a Googleville, kind of like Hoovervilles of the 20th century. Um, so where's this, the discussion on all of that? It's not happening. We're just washing that away, pushing it under the table, and instead discussing jobs. It's not about jobs, it's about the people. And there's a lot more than jobs when companies come in to cities like this. We can't let Google strong arm San Jose like Amazon is strong arming Seattle. Thank you. Thank you, Ayani. Vera followed by Liz Gonzalez and Roland. Okay, it looks like Vera, there you are. Okay, Liz Gonzalez. Thank you. From day one, this body has been illegitimate. I still believe that. I don't even want to be here um, because we're going to remember you as the people that welcome gentrification, that welcome the destruction of our community. You all really are not thinking big enough because you can't even imagine a world, you can't even imagine a San Jose without corporate overlords. That's what's happening and that's what your vision is. It's appalling. It's appalling to hear this is the community engagement process. Y'all don't represent the community. You don't look like the community. You have no idea. You don't even care what the community wants. I know I'm generalizing, but most of you here have a financial interest in this deal going through. How does that make sense? How does that fucking make sense? My comment is really about the community meeting at Mayfair. I think it was on June 23rd. It was the Spanish community meeting by the city of San Jose. It was presented by somebody who doesn't even speak Spanish. How embarrassing, how embarrassing. And the city staff totally defending Google like they already worked for them because yep, they do. Our city council, our mayor, our city manager, y'all are already working for Google. They were twisting people's words, asking repeatedly, how can you say that in a positive way? What kind of process is this? They were not listening to the community. So when you give your report back, is that going to be in there? I do want to say from those, people said, we cannot trust the city of San Jose. We cannot trust Google. There's no trust here. And they said, we want to be the architects, we want to be the architects of our city. And we do. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. The last speaker we have is Roland, unless there's any others that want to get a speaker card in. Thank you and good evening. So um, I'd like to focus on a couple of points, starting with echoing some of the comments our former vice mayor made earlier is that we essentially here try to attempt to, um, we're focusing on potentially mitigating potential impacts, but we're not looking at the positives. And a gentleman earlier mentioned uh, potentially, you know, educating the uh, younger generations. And another comment I advise May made is that why are we focusing on Google? Why aren't we focusing on all the other companies that are moving in here? And I'll give you an example, is the gentleman that mentioned that 10% of the renters in last year have received eviction notices. Is that because of Google? We've got to ask ourselves, why is this happening? And then another thing, I'll give you an example of uh, other things which are uh, impacting people. It's, let's look at the BAR project. Uh, Bill mentioned these issues of uh, integration um, with Deridan. Does that anybody in this room know that Bath is potentially about to displace 46 families. And if you don't, I suggest you attend the Bart Bond meeting on, on the 5th, and on the 11th, the VTA will actually be here in this room, talking about this displacement. And maybe it's a time for people to show up there and educate themselves about what's happening and voice this con their concerns. And last comment I'd like to make about what's going on with Bart and Deridan. 
the time has come for us to tell the VGA that Bart is essentially the tail wagging the deer in the dog. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to come up. It's been really frustrating, frustrating as a housing advocate and an advocate for the unhoused people that you frequently have to, the only way that we've been able to affect change is when somebody dies or when somebody is dying. The only way that we managed to get duplexes covered under the TPO was when Richard Kavanaugh died after being evicted from his duplex of 50 years. The only way that we got, sorry, the only way that we got changes with the Ellis Act and the only way that we got um, rent control passed was when uh, Ann Sherman's dad was evicted from his home of 44 years, and he was Paul Mayer, the 92-year-old veteran that died as a result of his eviction. Um, I'm just really tired of having to bring the dead and dying to bodies to be able to affect any change. You have a chance to change that and say, we need to have an anti-displacement ordinance to prevent this. Because I feel like a cat, like I bring you the dead, and then you go, oh, we should do something about that. So it gets really old, and it's really done a lot to my soul. What's also done a lot to my soul is while we were out there, routinely, people who were white came up to the door and walked right in. People who weren't white, who would leave here, go outside, go to the bathroom, get a cup of coffee, get some air, and come back in, were not allowed back in. And I don't know what's wrong, but clearly there needs to be some training with the security staff here because we had to chant so that the one woman got back to her own seat. We routinely had people here who were brown, who walked out to the bathroom and people, they weren't let back in. We saw this. We saw a white guy walk from the outside, walk straight to the door and get let back in. I don't understand what the problem is and I don't understand what your problem is with free speech. You should have met in the chambers where all of us could be together, but I'm glad you chose the sauna because it looks like y'all enjoyed that. Thank you very much. Um, so we were gonna spend a little bit of time um, at the end of the meeting talking about your report. Um, but I think during public comment, almost all of you came up to me and, and mentioned the heat issue. So I do apologize for that. That's not a tactic of any stretch. You've probably seen three or four employees run back and forth in the hallway several times to try and fix the situation, but it doesn't appear to be working. So my question to the group is, we can spend another 15 or 20 minutes together talking about the draft comprehensive report, or you all have it in your packet, you can look at it, and we can spend 10 or 15 minutes at the beginning of next meeting. Our intent today was simply to just introduce it as that, um, not walk through it in great detail, but to allow you guys to absorb it a little bit because it is your report and then have a discussion about it. So I'm fine given kind of the situation of the room having lost five pounds myself tonight. Um, if you guys would choose to <laughs> want to come back and have that discussion in three weeks as opposed to doing it now because I know several of you and, and several of the members of the public and, and staff are very uncomfortable in this room right now. So unless someone says otherwise, I think we will ask each of you to take a look at it and then come back. Teresa. Do you have, do you have slides associated with this or is, it, is that it? We is have that one it? great slide. Why don't you just, do you mind covering that? Sure. Um, so as we've, we've thought about it, and again, we'll be quick um, um, so we get you guys out of here. Um, as we've thought about the report, obviously no report is um, good without an executive summary and introduction. We do want to spend quite a bit of time in this report as staff, kind of on the background and context. Um, if someone were to read this report and start reading these solutions, I think it would be confusing to the reader. So we do want to give kind of the background of the context, what's happened with some of these issues and how we got here today. And then highlight the community engagement process, the meetings that have happened here, the pop-ups, the community forums that have happened in the neighborhoods as well as some of the online forums, and many of you have conducted your own community outreach that we would probably roll into that. And then begin to kind of flush out the key themes. And I think a lot of those key themes are based off of our solution groups. 
and then start identifying the potential solution. So within that potential solutions in group or in number six, we would keep our kind of the subcommittees or the solution group areas and talk about how you prioritize those and why um, and where they belong, whether it um, is in this report, if the city is going to be doing something. I know some of the groups um, wanted to make sure, even if it um, was like a high-speed rail issue, um, that it still be identified in the report and then we speak about it. So we'll do that. And then start to highlight conclusion and next steps. So that's kind of a general framework that we would like to follow. But again, that's us kind of throwing it out to you. We would want you guys to think about it a little bit more over the next few weeks. And um, please contact Lori or I in the meantime if you have any ideas on you know, rearranging it, tweaks, or anything else. And we will work on the air conditioning in the meantime. Nathan. Sorry. Uh, is this uh, posted online, this draft? It is posted online. And if you go to the agenda, it's, it's linked. So you can go right in. Perfect. Thanks. Okay. Um, and yes, thank you, Lori. Can you go to the next slide? There you go. OK. So sorry, Polar. Just really quick, can you give us a deadline? For, for giving for us information on the yeah. report? Um, I'd say the August 29th. We're going to come back and talk to you guys about it then. Um, so any information you guys have or ideas before then, please email. But I think you can bring a lot of it to the meeting on the 29th. Okay. Um, so we will be back together on August 29th. Um, and then we have scheduled two other meetings for September 27th and October 18th. Um, those all, you know, um, we'll get the um, locations out. I think some of them will happen in here. If we're going to think about a larger meeting like tonight, we will see about the, the possibility and the logistics of having it in chambers or somewhere else to accommodate that um, if need be. But with that, I'm sorry, Bill. So, so I actually won't be here at the next meeting, which is fine. Uh, my question is, what is the uh, kind of uh, uh, review and edit process going to be? And do you expect this to be 500 pages, 50 pages? Like how much will it need to be synthesized so I feel pretty confident saying it's not gonna be 500 pages okay. um, I do think you know one of the things that Lori and I have talked about is um, obviously you can see tonight with some of the wording on the potential solutions us getting m maybe like a, an and or an or wrong um, so what I think we would like to do is we start to build out the sections we would probably go back and do any editing or wordsmithing maybe like at the solution group and ask for some input there um, to try and avoid kind of like an edit by design around this table. Um, and I also think what we've talked about including is quite a bit of appendices, uh, of appendices of the report with all the raw data. So if anyone ever wanted to go back and look at like the actual wording or any votes or anything like that, they'd be able to see that. So that might be a little bit thicker, but I think the report would be shy of 500 pages. Thank you. <laughs> Nicole? I'm still very concerned about the unofficial not in my backyard group that's starting to form within the SAG. And um, if, is there any way that we can keep them from meeting in private and then publishing papers to the SAG? Because I feel that that is a detriment to the SAG. Of a smaller subsection of the SAG producing policy reports, you think is a detriment? I think not in my backyard, yes. It's the creation of the housing crisis, especially in the Bay Area. And they're starting to have a very strong voice on this committee, and I'm very concerned about it. OK. Um, I would say I'm not 100% sure how to respond to that right now. I think that goes back to some of the stuff that you guys agreed to as a group on how you're going to work together. OK. So if we do want to spend some time on that in the next meeting, I'm happy to do that. Um, but I think that's a conversation amongst you all. As well, Kathy. I'm not sure if that's referring to the letter from Delmas Park and Greater Gardner mm -hmm. and North Willow Glen. And if it is, I'd love to have a conversation with you offline because that was not the intent at all. Okay. Thank you, Kathy. Mm -hmm. Stephen. It's been a challenge, just, it would help me if there was clarity on is the report recommendations for the station area globally? 
And how specific is it going to be the Google project? Because I think all of the meetings go back and forth between are there recommendations for the potential sale agreement for Google in December, or are they specific to the stationary development? I think it's going to be a challenge to write the report addressing both things, or is the report going to have a singular focus on one of those two? Yeah, so I, I, I think it would be difficult to have the report just focus on one of those things, given kind of the, the diverse perspectives around the table and kind of everyone that's had ideas has had really good ideas and really rich and they've either kind of been on something that should be in a Google MOU or like I've said, high speed rail or you know the disk process. So I think as staff, what we need to do is we go back and look at the potential solutions and start to write this and draft this for you guys it, to kind of say, you know, where that conversation belongs. And there obviously is going to be a larger Duradon station area kind of land use process and, and engagement around the station. Um, and there's obviously things in the report, quite frankly. Um, you know, I, I oversee the intergovernmental relations um, team at the city. There's a report or there's a recommendation there that I need to follow separate from any of this uh, related to Costa Hawken. So I think there's several things in there and we'll need to find a way to kind of identify who starts working on that and where it belongs. But I don't want to keep any of those solutions out because they don't fit in a certain box. Yes, Sandra. Hi, uh, Sandra Weber, Planet 51. I do remember reading in the housing solutions notes that there was the option of seeking heights limit increase around the Deer Don area, which would you, one would assume means increased density. So it, in the report, will we also have links to maybe updates with regards to those types of uh, issues? Yes, and I believe we're going to come in September, correct? We'll brief you on the Sutherland findings around that issue at your September meeting. Perfect. Yes. Thank you. Yes, and what does OEI stand for? One engine yes, one engine and operative. It's a bad thing. <laughs> yes, it is a bad thing. Okay, um, thank you for sweating it out with us. We will be back on August 29th. Thank you, everyone.